I lived for a while in an Ohio town that wasn't far away from Wheeling, West Virginia. This was quite a long time ago, mind you, and I was only there for about a year. I'm having a really hard time trying to actually remember the name of it. I suppose that's not too important, though. What is important is that I was 13 years old at the time. I had an older brother and a younger sister as well. I really didn't like being around my parents at that time. I was really happy during the summer of that year when I got to stay for about a month at my aunt's house. She lived way out in the country, as my family always put it, although I always thought that sounded a bit weird. I mean, technically, doesn't everyone live in their country? I guess I didn't really understand. This was back in the 1980s, so there wasn't as much readily available entertainment as there is today. We would get to have a frozen pizza every Friday and have to go into town to rent some videos. We would always out for cheesy 80s horror movies and stay up really late. I saw a lot of VHS horror that summer, but for the rest of the days we would have to make our own entertainment. It was particularly hot inside that day. My aunt only had a couple of fans and they weren't doing their best. My aunt only had a couple of fans to cool the place down, and they weren't exactly doing the best job that day. There was a slight breeze outside, and it was actually much cooler to just go out there and play around. We decided to go for a bit of a walk. The road my aunt lived on was paved with gravel. She lived in this very beautiful rural area with very few homes around. The road was actually a pleasant walk during the summer. It was at the bottom of many hills, which had tons of shading trees upon them. At this time of day, they were casting their shadow across the road, making it the coolest place my cousin and I could be at the time. We were walking for a while, and as I mentioned before, there was a cool and consistent breeze this day. I would say the wind was at about 16 miles per hour, maybe. We were having a jolly old time just talking about some things going on in our lives. All of a sudden, though, my cousin stopped walking, and he got this very odd look upon his face. He looked off into the distance, in the trees on the hill. I asked him if something was wrong. He took a moment, and then responded, I don't know, I thought I just heard something, but I guess I can't be sure. He sort of narrowed his eyes, as if he was searching for something up on that hill, after a moment, though, he just shook his head. The two of us began to walk again. It was Friday afternoon, and once my aunt got home from work, we were going to go and pick up our videos for the night. We were discussing what we were going to rent. I very distinctly remember him mentioning wanting to watch The Monster Squad. That wasn't really a horror movie at all, though. We both heard the same noise coming from the trees just then. It was not just the sound of footfalls crunching upon the leaves, but we could also hear someone who sounded like they were breathing quite heavily. Finally, we saw something accompanying this sound as well. Just 20 feet ahead of us, someone suddenly burst out of the trees. A man much bigger and older than either of us, dressed in all shabby clothing. I remember clearly he was wearing a denim jacket and what looked to be a baseball cap as well. That was not what stood out most about this man, though. The man was covered in blood. He also seemed panicked and shocked to see us when he looked over to us. I could understand why. There was a lot of forest around here, and not a lot of people. Running out onto this road more often than not, you would be all alone. The man seemed unsure of what to do and just stared us down for a moment. We were frozen in place, also not sure what to do. The man then moved forward, as if he was going to rush at us. He quickly stopped himself, though. He seemed to rethink his choice for a moment. Instead, he turned and ran off in the other direction. We didn't follow him, of course, as the two of us were already scared enough. Remember, we had been watching a lot of scary movies that summer, and this seemed like a scene right out of one of them. The last thing we needed to do was follow someone who might be crazy, dangerous, or both. My cousin even thought that maybe that guy had just killed someone out in the woods. He suggested we should go and see if someone was out there. 
If the man really had attacked someone and that someone was still alive, then it wouldn't be good to just walk away, now would it? I agreed. And besides, we were two 13-year-old boys. We should be able to handle ourselves. We cautiously started up the hill in the area we had seen the madman run down from. I would like to tell you I was being brave as hell, but honestly, I was terrified the entire time. I kept expecting the guy to loop back around and ambush us from behind or something. When we got to the top of the hill and were making our way down to the other side, we hoped to find something. Eventually, we did find something, but it completely changed what we had perceived had happened. There was a creek not too far from where we were, and we could see a huge man hanging over it. His back was turned towards us, but we could tell what he was doing. He had this large knife and was wiping it off in the creek water. We didn't have to say anything to each other. We both realized what we were seeing and what had actually happened. We also realized we might be in some big trouble right now. As quiet as we could, we crept behind two trees. Still curious, though, the two of us kept looking out from behind the tree at the man by the creek. We were very fortunate he didn't appear to notice us. After the guy had cleaned his knife off of all the blood and dried it off, he sheathed it once more. Then he took off in the opposite direction of us. I breathed a silent sigh of relief because this guy was even bigger and scarier looking than the guy we had seen running out onto the road. Once this guy was gone, we still waited for a while before heading back down the hill. We had seen enough scary movies to know you can never know if the killer would come back at any moment. We didn't feel safe until we got back down to the road. Once we did, we hurried back to my aunt's house. We told them what we had seen, and strangely enough, they didn't seem to be very concerned at all. They still slept with the house unlocked as they always did and I never really found out what happened in that situation. I did know it was much scarier than any of the movies that we watched, though. My grandma and grandpa lived in a very old house. I think it used to be a one-room schoolhouse way back in the day. They put up walls, and there was an upstairs sort of attic that was a living quarters, I guess. My grandpa himself built a sort of addition onto the back of the house. That addition was really flimsy, though. It was literally just built with boards. There was no outside siding, no insulation, no drywall on the inside. It did have a window that faced into the backyard, though. The reason I'm telling you about this particular room is that whenever we took the trip to Grandma and Grandpa's house, that was always the room I slept in. I have to admit as well, it was a very freaky place to sleep. The house was in the opening to a holler. When you looked back through the window, you were looking into a beautiful countryside, but at nighttime it transformed into a dark and frightening scene. Of course, there were no lights at this part of the house at all, and when you were in the room itself, your eyes would get quite used to the dark. When they did, you could see things back there in shadowy movements, tree branches going back and forth, animals out in the wild. This happened in winter, when I was 15 years old. My family drove to Grandma's house, and we got there a couple of hours before bedtime. That was what we normally did. We would watch Jeopardy, eat dinner, and go to bed not long after. One thing I remember about this is that when my grandpa got up to do something at one point, I began to rock his chair back and forth with my foot. This was a big no-no with my very superstitious grandparents. They had this weird fixation that if you rocked an empty chair in the house, it would cause someone to die soon. My grandma looked quite worried, and the look on her face told me I should stop doing this immediately. All my life, I'd been the type to stay up late at night, and then sleep in late in the morning. I really liked being up at night, actually. My mind seemed to work better when I was up in the nighttime hours. I went to that room when everyone else went to bed, but I didn't go to sleep right away. Instead, I stayed up for a while reading a book, with the not-so-bright lamp in the back room. It was a pretty cold night out, but that didn't really bother me. 
the bed in the back room had some heavy quilts on it in order to keep warm. There was also an old space heater I could use if it got too cold for me, but those occasions were very rare. There's just something nice, you know, about laying down in the cold weather, warmed up by tons of blankets. I even remember the book I was reading that night, Pet Cemetery by Stephen King. You know, I don't normally get scared by books, but this one was really scary. I had to admit I was already a little bit spooked out every time I was in that room. If I didn't want to enjoy the ambiance, though, I guess I wouldn't have been reading a scary book to begin with. As I read on, I would occasionally look up and out the window for a moment. The darkness added to the fear I was feeling from that book. I'm not sure how long I stayed up reading. If you've ever read that book before, I think you'd understand why, though. While I'm not the biggest fan of King's work, there's something about the atmosphere of this particular book that really pulled me in. Finally, though, I was exhausted. I was thoroughly on edge and ready to go to sleep. The lamp was right by the bed. Once I turned it off, everything was totally dark for a while. I knew I wouldn't be able to fall asleep right away. That's just not what I do. Instead, I laid down and looked out the window, and just kind of ruminated in my nighttime thoughts for a while. Eventually, I did doze off. Since I was asleep somewhere other than my own bed, though, I tended to sleep in little blocks, you know? Wake up for a few moments, go to sleep over again, wake up, fall back asleep. I was sleeping facing the window, so the first time I woke up, I just looked out into the darkness. I could see a little bit better than before, and I could see the branches of several trees swinging in the wind. After looking at them swaying hypnotically for a few moments, I swiftly went back to sleep. The next time I woke up, it was pretty much the same thing. I saw some swinging branches and fell back asleep. I'm not sure how many times I repeated this, until the moment I woke up and looked out the window once more. This time, in addition to the swaying trees, I saw something out the window. A dark something but I could tell it was looking in through the window at me. It took my sleepy mind a few moments to realize that I was not dreaming this. All of a sudden, I noticed what looked like a hand reach out from the side of the window and begin to tap on the glass. I heard the tapping distinctly, and I could make out the hand's prints very clearly. I jumped up and out of the bed in shock. I had to do everything I could not to yell out in fear, my impulse was to rush away from the window and out the room, but I resisted that, looking back to the window. Now, there was nothing there. I walked over cautiously and peeked out, trying to see if someone was out there or if they were running away into the darkness or something like that, but I didn't see anyone there. It was pitch black. I could hear the trees howling in the wind, but I couldn't make out the figure anymore. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know if I was still sleeping and had just dreamed the entire thing, or if someone was skulking outside my room. It took me a long time before I was able to go back to sleep. I told my family about this the next day. My grandma told me something about never rocking the chair without someone sitting in it, suggested perhaps some demon had come for me or something. That's pretty ridiculous. It did get me thinking, though, that maybe my grandpa had done it to teach me some respect about their beliefs or something. If he did, he never admitted to it. I wouldn't have put it past them, but maybe someone really was just skulking out my room that night. This is the story of the strangest thing that ever happened to me in my life. At the time, I lived in the suburbs of Chicago. I had just gotten my heart broken not long before this and was trying to get back into the dating scene if I could. I was quite lonely and I went for trying to meet someone online. I began to speak with a man named Robbie. He was a bit younger than me, which wasn't something I really liked. I was in my late 20s and he was exactly 20 years old and still lived at home with his parents. He wasn't going to community college at the time, either. I would normally have dismissed him because of this, but he was very persistent talking to me, and he seemed to be an interesting person regardless. 
He liked horror just as much as I did, so that got me interested in the very least trying to meet him. He lived in Wisconsin, but he lived in the rural part of the county. I didn't have a GPS, and this was before smartphones as well, so I had quite a bit of trouble finding his place. Eventually, I was able to find him, though, and picked him up. I should mention that all I wanted to do was go and have dinner and talk, get to know each other a little bit. We were getting along very well. He hadn't seen nearly as many movies as I had, and by talking a lot about them, he asked if I wanted to go buy some maybe, go back to his house and watch them together. I was a bit hesitant because he lived with his parents. You probably figured out by now that I'm a gay guy, which I guess I should have mentioned first. I felt really uncomfortable going back with his parents still there. Especially when he told me they didn't even know he was gay. They weren't gay positive at all either. He told me he would tell them that I was just a friend passing through, who needed a place to sleep and couldn't afford a hotel. He told me the many things he would tell his parents as lies. You know, this should have been like a thousand red flags at once, give or take. I was extremely uncomfortable with all of this, but I was on the rebound and Robbie seemed like a likable guy. Despite my apprehension, I decided, why not give it one try? We bought a couple of movies. I don't really recall all of them other than that one was a remake of the movie House of Wax, I think. I mostly only remember that as well because of the weird shit that happened while we were watching it. After shopping, we drove out to his house again. As I mentioned before, he lived in a very rural part of the county. His house was very old and sat on what I supposed used to be an old farm that was no longer tended to. The fact his house was so isolated made me feel really weird. Things were even stranger when I met his parents. I could tell right away something was off about them, and they didn't seem to like me either. I don't remember much about the father, but the mother was very overbearing. I could tell right away that if they didn't know their son was gay, they at least suspected it very strongly, and they were very, very angry about it. While we were watching the movie, I was sitting in a recliner that was in the middle of the living room. We had the lights off, of course, because it was a horror movie. Although the parents had said they were going to go to bed, there were times when I could hear something shuffling and sneaking behind me. I would turn around, only to see the mother peeking around the corner of the dark hallway, watching me. She would linger there for a moment, before seeing I'd noticed her and sprinting around the corner. Her absences would never last long, though. She would creep back through the darkness of the hallway and hide and keep watching me. There was one very scary moment. We were watching that House of Wax movie, only for me to turn around and notice her hiding in a doorway again, this time holding a knife in her hand. She held the handle with one hand and was lightly slapping the flat part of the blade with her other. I certainly knew she was not doing anything in the kitchen at the moment. It was even more scary, because I knew she knew I'd keep looking back and catching her there. This was something she wanted me to see. I really should have left right then and there, but Robbie didn't seem to think anything was going on. For some reason, the idiot in me decided not to leave. Robbie told his mom we were going to go to sleep. He showed her he'd made up a bed on the floor of his room for me to sleep on. Then he closed the door. He waited until she was gone in order to lock it. I laid down on the floor, not really knowing what was going on here. Robbie asked me to come up to the bed to cuddle with him. I liked him a lot, but I'm sure everyone listening to this story can realize how blind I must have been by this point. I guess I really, really liked him. I should have never gotten into this position. Needless to say, I didn't sleep so well. There were several times throughout the night I could hear the doorknob being turned and scraped against. I knew that was dear old mom checking to see if the door was locked. She was probably trying to open the door as well, to see if anything particularly gay was going on. This happened no less than five times. Each time it did, all I could think about was her standing there in the darkness with a knife in her hand. Somehow I managed to survive the night. The way his mother had acted didn't seem to bother Robbie at all either. He went through the entire experience as if nothing had ever happened. 
He was also completely oblivious to the fact his mom knew he was gay and was willing to try and scare his date with a knife in order to keep him from being so. I left the house as soon as possible to avoid encountering mom again. Not long after, I got a call from Robbie. His mom told him I wasn't allowed to come back, and he was really confused. Didn't matter much to me. I wouldn't have gone back there if he paid me. Strangely enough, not long after, Robbie decided he didn't really feel like being gay anymore. Last I knew of him, he was dating some girl in his church group. I really hope his mom didn't threaten him or something like that. The whole thing was way too weird and scary, and I was happy to never have to meet any of these people again. Like an idiot though, a while later I looked him up on Facebook, and to my surprise, I found him. Honestly, what I found is pretty disturbing though. It seems like he went through periods of acceptance, then suppressed them again. Eventually, he even started to support conversion therapy and believing that being gay can be cured. Having one's true identity suppressed can be the scariest thing of all. This was clearly a kid who was severely brainwashed and didn't have the slightest clue of what was going on. That's pretty scary. While out one night, I ran into a guy who was a really good friend of one of my ex-boyfriends. We hung out a bit that night, but there wasn't really any flirtation or anything between us. My ride wanted to go home, but I wasn't quite ready to leave myself. The guy said he would bring me home when the club closed in an hour. I had hung out with this guy many, many times before and never felt anything was wrong with him. I was not anticipating what would happen this night. We got into his car like usual and started on the way home. We got on the interstate, only for him to miss my exit. I told him he just missed the pass, and he told me, Yeah, I know, we're going to my place. In this moment, I knew something was off. I told him it was too late, I really just wanted to get home. He kept insisting I sleep over at his house and was not going to take no for an answer. I had never planned to visit that place in my entire life, but still I decided to play it cool. Maybe I could just crash on the sofa and make him take me home first thing in the morning. We get to his apartment, walk into the door, it's a bedroom. Apparently he lived in a studio apartment, so it was one big room with a bathroom and that was it. No sofa, just a single bed. He walked in first. He closed the door behind me and immediately turned the lights off. I couldn't see a single thing. He must have blacked out the windows because it was pitch black inside. He grabbed me and threw me against the bed. I was completely freaking out at this point. It was immediately clear he had no intentions of just letting me go to sleep. He kept on trying to touch me, kiss me, get me to cuddle up next to him. I kept thinking that if my ex knew what he was doing right now, he'd be very pissed. I tried to push him off, only for him to try again. Somehow, this went on for about an hour. I just wanted this night to be over. I knew I needed to do something, because he was a built man, and I was just a petite young woman. I didn't know how long I could defend myself from his assault. I couldn't even see my hand in front of my face either. I pushed him off once more got up, and walked until I found a wall. Luckily, he wasn't able to see me either. I was able to feel around for the bathroom door handle. I went into the bathroom and closed the door behind me. I didn't know what my next move should be. Unfortunately, this was before cell phones, so I couldn't call anyone for a ride. All of a sudden, he shoved the door against my back and managed to fling it open. Then he told me to get the fuck out and that he was bringing me home. He was steaming mad, too. I ran out of the apartment. I got into the car, and he didn't say a single word the entire way. He brought me home without a word said between us. I knew I'd just dodged a serious bullet, but I had no clue how serious it could have been until years later. This guy eventually went on to rear his girlfriend's five-year-old daughter so severely, she had to have reconstructive surgery. He pleaded guilty and is now in prison for a long, long time.
So today, I was staying in a hotel about 275 miles from home. I'd been in the city for a couple of days, but we just switched hotels last night due to the fact the other one was mold infested and filled with pests. How gross. Anyways, we were here to drop off my brother at college, and tonight was his last night with us before we left. We decided to have a silly string fight in the hotel parking lot and run around outside of the hotel for fun. You know, just doing some stupid teenager things. At one point, though, I noticed somebody was standing at the top of the stairs that led to the second floor of the motel, just watching us the entire time. No big deal at first. We were being pretty loud and obnoxious after all. My brother and my mom left, though, to bring my brother back to his dorm room. I decided to stay behind at the motel room, as all I had been doing for the past three days was riding in a car, and I really needed a break. I was on the phone with one of my friends, Adrian. I was just talking to Adrian on the phone, when all of a sudden out of nowhere, someone knocked on the door, using the exact same pattern my mom does. We had one of those secret knocks to let us know that one of us was knocking. I was just about to swing the door open without even checking like usual. I was 99% certain it must be my mother. As I went to do so though, something in my gut told me to look out the peephole first for some reason. The person standing outside my hotel room was not my mom. It was the same person who had been watching us earlier at the top of those stairs. I'm already a very paranoid person, so obviously I didn't just answer the door for him. Instead, I started freaking out and telling Adrian what was happening. After a few moments, the person began to yell through the door, Open this fucking door right now! He started to slam and bang against it. I sat there talking quietly to Adrian for five to ten minutes, then slowly walked back up to the door to look through the peephole. Just as I'd gone towards it, the person began to slam their entire body weight against the door and started violently shaking the handle as well. At this point, I texted my brother at least 30 times to come back right away. He said they were about 10 minutes away and to just sit tight and he was coming right back. He did come back as quickly as he could, but of course, by the time they got back there, the person was already gone. Maybe not the worst of experiences you've ever heard but it really shook me off pretty good. Update. Last night, I went to the front desk as we were leaving to go take my brother back to his dorm. I decided to go with them when the time came. I told them if anyone asked for a key card to my room in the meantime to not give it to them. Turned out this motel didn't require any ID or proof of you being in that room. You just ask for a key to room so-and-so and they give it to you. Apparently, my paranoia did pay off because according to the front desk clerk, that same man came later that day and asked for a key to my room. I'm not sure what would have happened if I would have opened that door or if they managed to obtain a key to my room so easily, and I'm glad I never have to find out. This happened to me in 2010. I was a college student at a school in a big city, which unfortunately was not in the best part of town. At the time, I was living in an off-campus apartment that didn't have dedicated parking spots. I always tried to park my car along either side of the building, right underneath the streetlight. On this particular day, however, I was only able to get a spot on the street behind the building. Around midnight, I left my apartment to drive to my then-boyfriend's house in another part of the city. He was a musician and was just getting home from a gig, hence the late-night meetup. I hated being outside in the city alone at night, but I hadn't seen my boyfriend in quite a while. I thought I could quickly make it to my car without much issue. To get to my car from my apartment, I had to walk out the front door of my building, turn the corner, walk alongside for about the length and width of a city block, and turn down the back street to where my car was parked. All in all, it should have taken no more than a few minutes. As I turned the corner to walk alongside my apartment building, though, I saw a man now walking directly toward me. 
At first, I thought he was just walking in a similar direction, but immediately he started to call out to me once he noticed me. Hey! Hey! He was far enough away up the street that I thought I could make it to my car before he caught up to me. I quickened my pace, and so did he to keep up. He kept on calling out to me over and over. Hey! Can't you help me? I'm homeless. I need to get home. Obviously, that made no sense. The closer he got, the more I could tell he was clearly on drugs, or at least on something. He was gaining on me as well, all the while calling out to me, asking for money to get home, when I suddenly realized I wouldn't be able to make it to my car before he'd make it to me. I stopped dead in my tracks underneath the streetlight on the side of the building. I always walked with my keys in my hand, so I would never be stuck digging around for them at an inopportune time, much like this one actually. Thanks to my mom making sure I always made sure to stay safe in the city, my keys were complete with a chain of mace as well. By this time, the guy was a foot away from me, aggressively asking for money and telling me he needed to get home. I told him I had no money and couldn't help him. He moved closer, until he was a few inches away from me. I picked up that mace, only for the streetlight to shine on it so perfectly the creep caught a glimpse of the shine and started to back away. The guy could have easily grabbed me, gotten violent and tried to snatch my purse or something, yet the mere sight of my mace was enough to get him to go away. He quickly sprinted off down the street. I sprinted to my car and sped away, shaking. Needless to say, I never walk to my car alone at night again. One of the most frustrating parts of this encounter is that it happened within sight of a city surveillance camera that wasn't functioning at the time. A few months prior to this incident, someone had tried to break into my car. When I asked the police and asked them to review the surveillance, they told me the cameras in that area didn't work and hadn't for a long time. Because of this, I knew there was no way this guy would have been caught either, which kept me constantly on edge. I thought that might have been the same guy who'd broken in before. I was so on edge that I actually moved out of the city entirely just a few months later. I need to get this off my chest. My fiancé, 27 and male, and I, 23 and female, are soon to be married and are remodeling an old family home. We started working on the house about two or three months ago, actually. My fiancé bought a bunch of tools to use on the house to renovate. The house had been sitting with nobody in it for over a year now. Keep in mind, it was also located in a fairly rural area. There were a few homes and trailers here and there, but really not much traffic and very far in between all of them. We had a bit of a rodent problem, and had been setting up some traps to catch them. Three weeks ago, my fiancé went to check the traps, and we had a rat that was still alive. Long story short, he didn't want to take care of it, so he left. I got off work at 9pm, and went over to the house to see what I could do about this rat. It was raining, and my mom and brother came with me. I went to the back door only to find it was wide open, and water was blowing into the house. I was beyond pissed. I thought my fiancé had left the door open when he'd gone. I shut it up and finished my business there. When my fiancé returned, I asked him quite angrily why he'd left the door open, and he claimed he never had. I'd simply called bullshit and left it at that. It didn't ever occur to me for some reason that somebody could have possibly been in there, and made a quick getaway when I arrived. Fast forward to today. My fiancé and I went about our house to throw a whole bunch of trash and things into a dumpster we had rented. When we went inside, I immediately noticed that some things were now missing. Drills, sanders, we realized they must have been stolen. I called my mother-in-law and told her about it, and she said to make a police report. What scared me so much about this is that as we did so, Everything began to click with that rat trap incident. Somebody had been scoping us out. I would go to our house by myself on many occasions, and I would always have the creeps and feel like I was being watched. My little brother had even remarked before that he felt watched there, and asked if we were sure nobody was in there while we were gone. I noticed today when I was there alone, 
My dog was acting very nervous and suspicious. She wasn't running around and playing like she usually did, and really didn't want me to go to the backyard or wooded area. I decided to trust her and my gut feeling. I don't know if there are thieves out there in those woods or what, but I really kinda don't want to find out. We're currently in the process of installing some cameras. This had to have been somebody that lives nearby and can monitor how often we're there. Update. We did catch a car pulling in like it was scoping the place out. The people inside never left their car, but they did wait around for a while. We asked a few of my fiancé's family members about this, and that was to our detriment. One of them went and spread the word that we had cameras, and somebody in the neighborhood who owned the same type of vehicle we caught on camera slipped up and said they already knew things had been stolen. This to me was basically a confession, because we hadn't told anybody about any robbery. At least, until the incident with the car was caught on camera. Now, more people than necessary know, and we probably won't ever catch the specific person who did it. We still turn the footage into the police, though. Maybe they can dig up some background info. This was a story I grew up hearing my mom telling me. I was really young when this happened, and I know for a fact it must have been before I was five years old. I have some foggy memories of something happening, especially because my mom at the time didn't want me to freak out. Some context. First, we have a family all over the country. I remember spending so much of my childhood just on road trips from state to state to visit different family members. We knew our ins and outs on traveling. Two, when I was a child, I would randomly hug strangers a lot and tell them I loved them. I was so filled with joy and love, it just spilled over onto other people. There was basically only one stranger I never immediately latched onto the second I saw them, and this is that story. My mom was taking me to visit some relatives while my dad was staying at home to watch my brothers. She had to go house-sit and, in general, was a better caretaker of me than my father was. It only made sense that I go with her. We were driving for hours until we finally hit a rest stop and got out to use the restroom. As we did so, we noticed immediately this guy meandering around the parking lot. According to my mom, it looked like he was closely watching everyone who was entering and leaving. The second we got out of the car, he began to observe us too. My mom held my hand tight as we headed to the restroom, but immediately picked up on the fact that I let go of her hand to hold on to her other hand, the sight of her away from the man. Looking back, she told me it was clear somewhere in my tiny child brain I must have picked up on some sign of danger or something. I seemed to be avoiding the man as much as I could and would quicken my pace to the restroom and car as well. I never did that with any other stranger. I never blatantly avoided another adult like that. Anyway, we do our business and head back to the car. The man had gone back to his car as well and was now watching us get ready to leave. Only, as we did so, he began to follow us in his own car. My mom immediately realized what was going on and tried to shake him off on the highway. He just wouldn't budge though and tried to get as close to our car as he could. Apparently, while doing this, a semi-truck driver also on the road noticed how frantic and off she was driving and could see her looking back at his car. He realized what was going on and drove up to her side, kinda made eye contact with her. They were on the same page from then on. Turns out the driver had called up on his radio to other truckers in the area and told them what was going on. A bunch of drivers from different routes came onto the same highway we were traveling on. A few minutes later, they began to block the man's car off, essentially completely trapping him away from my mother and I. She turned onto an exit to get off the highway to another rest stop as the original truck driver followed us. The man still boxed in by the other trucks. He got out and talked to my mom and told her he'd picked up on what was happening. He asked us if we were okay and drove with us to a Burger King. He even got us something to eat. We talked quite a lot and he followed us back onto the road until eventually... We went our separate routes.
My friends and I enjoy hiking mountain bike trails in the woods on a mountain nearby our houses. One day they couldn't go outside though, so I brought my younger sister with me instead. I was also going to bring my little brother, but he was going to be a little bit late since today he was staying at a friend's house. This day was a little bit rainy and was also quite cold. Nobody would be out hiking the trails today. They had never seen what my friends and I had been working on the past couple of months either, so that was the day to show them. Basically, you walk straight down a trail. When it turns 90 degrees, you go to the right just off it, then around a bend. There's an overgrown, abandoned forest road at this area. At the end of this forest road, we had made a small trail that led to the bottom of our MTB trail. My sister and I waited for my little brother to arrive. But then my mom called me, telling me my brother didn't know where to go. I told my sister to go all the way back to wait for him outside the trail in our neighborhood. She never saw him though. He decided since he didn't know where to go despite the clear instructions that he was just going to go back home, which my mom called to inform me. I called my sister to tell her to come back up the trail to meet up with me, telling her very clearly to make sure nobody was following her. This wasn't for our safety, but so nobody would discover these trails me and my friends were building. We wanted it to stay a secret. Something about this time was a bit different, though. As my sister began to walk back down the trail, I could see through the forest all the way across the road to where she was on her way up. Then, I thought to myself, wait, was she wearing a white jacket before? I realized as this figure got more towards the clearing, that this was not my little sister. This was a fully grown man. Nobody should have known about this trail, and even if they did, they would have no reason to come up here. Plus, the rain the past couple of days had made most of the trail muddy, extremely muddy. I started running down the trail, then hid behind a tree so I could call my sister and tell her not to come back. All of a sudden, I heard someone call out to me. What are you doing? It was my little sister. She had already made it all the way back up to where I was. I knew what was happening now. This man was following my sister specifically. I was terrified. I could tell my sister was starting to pick up something serious was going on as well. I grabbed her and hid her behind a tree with me. We waited for around 10 minutes, but I didn't see the person anywhere. There was no way to go but up the trail towards us, so unless this person was hiding in the trees off the forest road, they must have turned back. We started to make our way back, as quickly and quietly as possible. I started to get the sense, though, that I was being watched. We made it to our bikes, which were thankfully still there. It seemed the man hadn't tried to steal them. I told my sister to grab her bike, so we could walk through the rest of the trail without the noise of our hub clicking. This way, we could hear everything going on around us. As we got towards the entrance of where the forest was, it was much easier to see the footprints. There was one set of large boot prints deep on top of my sister's smaller footprints, meaning they were more recent. I confirmed I was 100% not going insane. Once we got out of the forest, we started riding our bikes to the neighborhood, and I made sure to stay back to see we weren't being followed. We made it back home just fine in the end. We told our parents, who were just glad I was out there as well. All I could think about was what if my sister had been alone, or if the man had caught her while he was following her on the trail. What would have happened to her in the end? I don't like to think about it. So this happened to my little brother and I. We'll name him Dylan for confidentiality purposes. When we lived together a few years back, I was a 25-year-old man, and my little brother was 19 years old. We were just relaxing at home playing some Halo 3 on the Xbox, smoking a bowl and being brothers, hanging out in our usually daily days off from work. It was a Saturday night in mid-summer of 2009. We lived in a fairly quiet neighborhood. The neighbors were just far enough apart that you had plenty of privacy, and they'd never snoop into your business. It was still close enough, though, to all know each other, as our parents had lived in the house for years, and this was our childhood home. When my parents retired, they moved away and left the house to us, so we never had to worry about a roof over our heads. 
Now, our house was at the end of the cul-de-sac with the garage door to the right and our front door up four steps to the left of the window, between our garage door. From our kitchen, you could see straight out when the curtains were open. This particular night would grow to haunt my brother and I to this very day. After a few hardcore hours of gaming, it was about three o'clock in the morning. My brother needed to get up to stretch his legs and relax his hands a bit. He went downstairs to grab some water and a snack, when suddenly he came sprinting back up. He locked the door, freaking the hell out. I looked at him, confused as hell. What's wrong, man? With a pale, ghost-white face, he looked over to me. There's a guy on the porch, with his hands cuffed against the window, smiling ear to ear. We started to hear five knocks at the door, in a very peculiar pattern. We froze in our tracks, slowly backing away from the door. I got under my bed and grabbed my bat I kept underneath, just in case I'd ever need to defend myself. I gave the bat to Dylan, as he was much taller than me, and had longer arms. It would be more beneficial to him. We both tiptoed back over to the bedroom door, and unlocked it slowly. We cracked open the door, just enough to peek out of. All of a sudden, the man began to knock over and over. Before you knew it, he had knocked at least 30 times, then just stopped. I told Dylan to grab my cell phone and call 911, and slam the door shut once more. He did so, and dispatch sent officers our way immediately. Well on the phone, the man went around the back of our house. We could hear screaming coming from the backyard. The man was there, looking into our bedroom window with that creepy-ass smile. We stayed out of the line of sight, peeking from the corners as much as we could. Suddenly, the man took off in a full-on sprint and threw himself against our back door. She told the units to step it up, as now he was trying to break our back door as well. We could hear the sirens closing in faster and faster as the man continued to bash himself into our door for some reason. On the third bash, we heard the door crash open. We stayed as quiet as possible, listening to things in the kitchen being smashed to hell. The man was screaming out, Come out, come out, wherever you are! I whispered to dispatch that he was downstairs in the kitchen. She told the officers he'd made entry, and one unit said they were close. We readied our weapons, as we heard footsteps creaking up the stairs. Blue lights could be seen illuminating the house. We heard the police calling out. The man booked it back down the stairs, only to get tackled by an officer and handcuffed after a bit of struggle. We came out when the officers cleared the house, and made sure it was safe. The man was high on meth, looking to rob us for another quick fix, I guess. We're thankful the officers arrived when they did. We thanked them until the moment they left. The police officer that tackled the man even came by from time to time to check on us, and played video games with us a few times as well. I still get nightmares from that man's creepy-ass smile. Back in late 2014, around October or November, I was 18 years old. I was very much enjoying my new freedom from the confines of childhood. At the time, I'd just gotten my driver's license and drove a 1998 Chevy sports van. I did pretty much everything in this van. It was pretty much a hangout spot on wheels, and I started making a lot of new friends. One night, when I went to go see some of these newfound friends, something happened that I still cannot explain. It was late at night, when I decided to drive some odd 25 miles to go see my friends. Between my town and theirs were only dark, quiet country roads. Every once in a while, you'd pass a driveway maybe with a street light on the property, but that was about it. Ever since I was a kid, there had always been one road around the county that people liked to whisper about. They called it the Swamp Road. The road was located just past the local high school, in the county closest to my town. This school was in the middle of nowhere, and it was a very eerie sight at night. The road itself was extremely dark and completely silent, located right in the middle of a large patch of woods. This made it even more terrifying. Of course, this was the path I had to take. 
As I pulled onto that road, I somehow managed to keep my cool. It was a commonly used shortcut to the area where I was going, so I had no issue driving down it at the time. The road had several hills along it as well, then came to an opening out of the woods, then banked right, then left again before hitting more hills and finally a stop sign. As I was hitting the very last hill right before the opening, at the edge of the woods, my eyes suddenly locked onto a bright white sheet on the side of the road. It was so distractingly bright in the darkness that I almost managed to hit a pothole. I ended up passing that white sheet by and continuing forward, but I started to think about things as I drove on. I've always been one to think about bags at the side of the road. What if it's money, or someone threw out a dog they didn't want, or something worse? My curiosity got the better of me, and once I hit that stop sign at the end, I decided to briefly turn back and see what that was. Right after the first turn, there was a small field entryway that I parked at. I decided to turn off the headlights and shut off the van as well. I'm not sure why I did that. I guess it was teen angst of not being afraid. The walk back to the edge of the woods was a bit longer. The only reason I didn't want to park closer was because a car could potentially come over the hill, get freaked out and wreck because of the van being parked there. I parked a little ways back and walked toward the edge of the woods. The moon was pretty bright out, so it wasn't that scary. Once I got a bit closer to the woods though, I noticed some of the trees were not quite dead yet and covered up most of the light, making it nearly impossible to see. I pulled out my phone and turned on the flashlight to see that the sheet was completely gone now. Nothing was there. My heart sank at first. Maybe it wasn't at this hill though. Maybe the next hill up or something. As I was about to start walking once more, I began to hear a rustling sound out in the woods. I didn't even have time to think. I didn't know if the sound was going away or coming right at me. All I remember is I heard something running fast in those woods, and it sounded like whatever it was, was dragging something along the ground. I ran back to my van, started it up, and immediately shot out of there. During the drive to my friend's home, I tried to tell myself that whatever I'd just witnessed was completely understandable and rational. Perhaps it had just been a sheet full of trash or something, and an animal had come and drug it away got spooked when they heard me walking towards them in the woods and ran. I got to the park that I usually pick my friends up at and waited for them to arrive. I got out of the van for a moment to throw something away near the restrooms when I saw something that made my blood run cold. On the rear of my van and the side, there were bloody handprints all over it. No joke, I was looking at bloody dripping handprints on the back windows of my van. I was the only one there. I don't know if maybe someone was trying to prank me back at Swamp Road, but if they did, it really got me good. I was driving well over the speed limit the rest of the time because I was so scared. To this day, it's still the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. When I was about 14 or 15, we moved to a new town hundreds of miles from our old one near Los Angeles. The new town was older, much, much smaller community as well, very old-fashioned style of people leaving the garage doors open at night because no one worried about security. My family, though, coming from a town where we knew better, never left any of our doors open. One weekend, my parents went out of town, leaving me home alone. They went back to our old city to visit my aunt and uncle. I didn't really care though. I just wanted to have the home to myself and be able to do whatever I wanted. I had a couple of friends over. We ordered some pizza and watched rented movies together. Around 10 or 11, everyone else went home. I was now home alone in this huge old five bedroom house. My bedroom and our family room were upstairs. So when my friends left, I just stayed upstairs with the TV on and started to fall asleep on the sofa. At around 1am though, I was suddenly woken up. I can't remember if I heard something or felt something, but I know that I woke up in a complete panic. I could hear noises coming from downstairs. I realized I was in the dark, 
with only the light from the TV to guide me. Our family room light had turned off for some reason, and I didn't remember ever turning it off. I jumped up and started turning lights on from upstairs. I could hear footsteps in the dark downstairs and hear someone walking across the tile flooring. My dad kept a shotgun for just in case upstairs in the spare bedroom. I knew how to use guns for my entire life, and he trusted me with it too. Back in the day, that wasn't so bad. I grabbed the shotgun. It was only a single shot loaded, so I put three more shells in my pocket. I walked very slowly downstairs. The stairway had very little light, as the light switch downstairs lit the bottom half only. I made my way over to the front room lamp, then to the kitchen light. I went down the hallway to the bottom floor bedroom, turning on every light I saw and checking every room. I didn't hear anything or see anything out of the ordinary now. I made special precaution to check my parents' bedroom and bathroom. I figured that if there was someone there, the burglar would surely be in there going for cash or jewelry. I didn't see any windows or doors open. I started to think that maybe I was just making myself hyped up over nothing. I made my way back to the stairway and the front room. The front room had a living room that my mom always called the sitting room. We were not allowed to hang out there usually, but it's where guests would sit down while waiting to enter the main home. You know, kind of a fancy room. Anyway, that room had the front door and the stairs leading to the side door to the garage. When I checked our front door, I saw it was locked. Then I turned to the garage door, only to see that door was unlocked. We kept that door leading from our house to the garage locked at all times. Something inside me dreaded to open it, but I figured I had to check the garage too now. When I opened the door from the house to the garage, I nearly crapped my pants. The garage door was open. This was impossible. My parents had left much earlier that day, and I knew for a fact that door had been closed after they left. I would have noticed if it was open at any point. While I was cleaning my room when my friends came over, I had taken all my laundry out to the garage. When I said goodbye to my friends, I walked out with them, and for sure I would have seen my garage door open at that point. I turned on all the lights in there as well. The garage was empty. Just the big door rolled up. I hit the button to close it and locked the door from the garage to the house. I went back upstairs and pretty much stayed awake all night with the loaded gun next to me. Nothing happened during the night, thankfully. The next day, I put the shotgun back unloaded. I went outside to see if someone had maybe forced the door open or something. No tool marks or anything. I looked throughout the garage and noticed someone seemed to have opened my dad's toolbox. I couldn't tell if anything was missing, though. It did, in fact, look like someone had been rooting around. I decided against telling my parents what happened when they came home. Only if my dad noticed something missing was I going to do so. Mostly because I knew how they were, and I didn't want them to blame me for leaving the door open when I'd clearly done nothing wrong. I also didn't want them to never leave me home alone again. I wonder if what shook me awake was the noise of the garage door opening, but I was too sleepy to realize it in the moment. To start, I suppose I should give you some context. This happened sometime in October. I was at my dad's apartment complex. I need to explain the building layout before I go on. It had three floors and two entrances, one in the front near the parking lot, and another right by some trees that divided the property and another house nearby. That back entrance was where I usually smoked at night. I didn't want my dad giving me shit for smoking weed in the apartment. I was smoking out of a shitty homemade bong made out of a one liter Pepsi bottle. I had just finished a bowl actually and was packing another one. I had just taken my next hit and blew out a huge cloud of smoke. All of a sudden, I could see in my peripherals that something was moving around in those trees. I thought it might be a deer at first. I was a little bit sketched out though because the area of Canada I live in is known for having some real bad drug addicts and other crazy-ass people. I pushed the feeling aside initially and simply took another hit. 
This time, I knew for sure I saw something, though. I could see someone sneaking on the little path in the woods. I immediately took one final hit when I saw a man wearing what looked like blue coveralls, wearing a clown mask. Normally, I get the fuck back inside and go back to my apartment. I was so high in that moment, though, I called out to the man. Hey, man, you want a hit? The man looked over to me. I couldn't see his eyes because of the mask, but I could tell he was glaring daggers at me. The man went to reach behind his back as I fumbled for my keys. I stuck them into the lock and shakily unlocked the door as the man began to charge at me. He was holding what looked to be a gut hook knife. I got in before he arrived and threw the door shut. The man managed to sneak his arm inside though and hold the door open. At that moment, I knew I was fucked. I yelled out for help as loud as I could. I didn't know what to do for a moment. Then, I remembered some martial arts from my 10th grade classes. I threw a kick at his arm as hard as I could, and I ended up breaking it. The man dropped the knife, of course, and yelled out, Oh, you motherfucker! He ran full force at the door. I gave him the middle finger and slammed it in his face. I ran back to my apartment and called the cops right away. A few Mounties rushed in, and I gave them my statement. We were told they were looking for a man fitting his description. He had slashed two random people with the same knife he dropped, and one of them was in critical condition. They caught the man in the end when he tried to go to the hospital for his broken arm. His fingerprints were on the knife, and he was sentenced to eight years in prison. I still do smoke weed out there, but now I always carry a knife with me, and I always keep my guard up. So this is a story about what my mother experienced in our house when she was little. We live in the same old farmhouse she grew up in. When my mom was about 13 to 16 years old, my grandpa used to have to leave for a few days on business trips, as he was a big dealer in grain bins. My grandpa and grandma had divorced and no longer lived together. My mom would be left alone at the house because of this, and the neighbors would keep watch over her. Now, this wasn't such a big deal, because where my mom is from and where my family lives, it was a very small town in South Dakota. Pretty much everyone trusted each other. On multiple separate occasions, my grandpa would leave for a day or two, and my mom would be left all alone. Most of the time, she would invite her friends over to keep her company and enjoy the freedom of having no guardians around. After a while, though, Friends were simply invited over so she wouldn't have to be alone, and here's why. Late at night, my mom and her friends would be chatting in her room or sleeping, when all of a sudden, they'd hear the cellar doors of the basement open from the outside and someone walking down the stairs. The cellar was only accessible by those doors outside and from a single door in the kitchen. Once they heard that sound, they all froze in fear. My mom said usually after that would happen, Someone would take a stick and walk around raking all of the pipes and vents to make an echoing sound throughout the house and let my mom and her friends know the person was there. They lived in the upstairs portion, which is where all the rooms are located. Directly in the middle of the upstairs was a hallway leading down to the dining room slash living room, and at the bottom of those stairs was the patio door. Back when my mom was little, there used to be a really creaky screen door and main door that led to that room. Next to that door on both sides were two large windows that showed out onto the front lawn and patio. My mom said that person would then walk to the screen door and repeatedly open and close it, slowly, over and over. They would walk around the home, scraping all the windows with a stick, sometimes even walking around the whole house multiple times. If they weren't scraping those windows, they were pacing back and forth on the patio. It was a pitch-dark house and property, a mile out of town. Just to put into perspective how terrifying this was for her, this person was clearly trying to mess with her. This was in the early 80s, so there was only one phone in the home. Downstairs, in the living room, which just so happened to be directly above the cellar and basement. My mom and her friends had to run downstairs in the night 
while someone was wandering around the house and just outside. They'd call a family friend named Kevin. Every time they did, when Kevin arrived, the man would be gone. This went on for about four months or so, and only ever happened when my grandpa was away from the home. My mom believes it was the neighbor from down the road. We lived just outside of town, so our neighbor's neighbor was about one-fourth of a mile away. My mom said that he and his wife were batshit crazy. They didn't like anyone petting their horses, which my mom didn't know when she'd done so before. She was chased by the wife with a shotgun after. Goes to show just how crazy they were. My mom thinks he walked all the way up just to torment her for coming around their horses that one time. And of course, just because they were crazy as well. We all have no way of knowing, but it's still insane nonetheless. The story used to really terrify me as a kid, especially since we still live in that same house. I was 15, living in the Mojave Desert in Southern California during the 90s. Lots of wide open space and not many people around. One weekend, my dad and I take out our dirt bikes via trailer to the outskirts of a very small town called Barstow. It was midsummer, so not a lot of people were out riding, which typically was a common sight. The heat must have had something to do with it. After unloading our bikes, we decided to trek for a few hours, keeping track of landmarks and marking trails with red cloth under rocks to find our way back easily. After some time of riding and refueling brakes, we crested a hill, only to see a dilapidated cabin. There were many lone buildings in the Mojave, but rarely anything like this. This felt out of place right off the bat. Being the intelligent people we were, we decided to check this abandoned abode out. We opened the front door. The doorknob was barely hanging on. It seemed to be a single room, no bigger than a studio apartment. It was very obvious, though, that people had been staying there. There were candy wrappers, beer cans, lots of things with recent dates as well. A lone bucket outside reeked of heat-cooked human droppings. There was no furniture, but there was a single wall-mounted bench in a fireplace. The ceiling had lots of people carving names, messages, typical hearts with a date and two people's names. I decided to take a rest on the bench for a moment. As I sat down, I tucked my feet under the bench and put my toes on their tips on the floor. The instant I did this, I felt the floor begin to give way. In surprise, I looked down at the floor, which didn't seem to be attached to the rest of the wooden floor. I removed this cut-out piece, about a two-foot square. I called for my dad. He looked down through the hole with the flashlight from his bike. It went down about seven feet and back far enough for neither of us to be able to see the end. This is when my dad showed his parental instinct. He looked over to me. Well, uh, I'm too fat to check this out. You gonna go see what's down there? I took this as a challenge and climbed down by myself. There was a hallway carved out of the desert bedrock that went back about 15 feet. I walked along cautiously until it opened up into a large circular room. The room was empty, but it was very big. I continued to walk around until I stubbed my toe on something. I looked down, only to see a metal rod embedded into the bedrock with thick chains welded on. Huh. I looked over to the walls. The walls were full of scratch marks from fingernails, tons of them. The more I looked, the more I could see that there were bits of fingernail embedded in those scratches in the rock. My eyes began to water, and my heart started to race. I was legit freaking out now. I spider-monkeyed right out of the entrance and told my dad everything while trying to hold back my tears. He looked very worried. We hopped on our bikes and tailed it into high gear. Following those red rags we left as landmarks was the most stressful time I can remember in my life. We got back to the truck, loaded up, and booked it home. My dad hid the truck in the garage for a few days after, just to be sure no one recognized it and followed us. Never went back, and don't intend to either. We reported this to the police, but we never heard anything about it after. It 
It was a Sunday early in the morning. I live in the suburbs, but my parents own a farm that I enjoy going to because I get to see my dog when I'm there. Her name is Molly, and she's a mutt. She's not a tiny dog by any means, though. At the time, I felt very safe around her and would often take her for walks in a forest that was nearby. The day started off like any other. Me and my dad got in the car, drove around for a while, and arrived at the farm. I immediately got out and hugged Molly. My parents always got angry when I hugged her, since I'd smell like dog for the rest of the day. I put her leash on and asked my dad if I could take her for a walk real quick. He always thought we would just go down a road and back, but I always found it more interesting to take her out into the forest. I felt a certain kind of peace and relaxation there that was unmatched by anything else. We took a turn and headed out. As usual, when I got there, I'd take her leash off so she could go explore the woods on her own. Most of the time, I'd carve my name into the trees or look for anything interesting nearby. I was playing baseball with some rocks and a wooden leg, presumably from an old table, when I heard it. Molly was barking at something. This wasn't unusual when we were out in the forest. I thought it was a fox, or perhaps some other animal. I quickly grabbed the wooden leg and held it like a weapon. I knew if it was a fox, I wouldn't have to attack it, but I felt a sense of security while I was holding it still. I called out, Molly! Molly! But she just kept on barking. This was very strange for me, since she always came right to me whenever I called her. I followed the sound of her barks and stumbled across a scene I'll never forget. There was a man, in his late fifties or so, half naked and carrying a large machete in one hand. He was holding some moonshine in the other. This was the first time I'd ever stumbled across someone this far out into the woods, let alone someone half naked and carrying a big ass machete. He was completely ignoring Molly, hacking away at the ground for some reason. I didn't really know how to handle the situation. Even now I would have no idea how to handle this. Uh, sir, are you okay? I asked in confusion. I don't think I understood the seriousness of this situation at the time. The man turned around, revealing his face. He had some of the clearest blue eyes I've ever seen to this day. I could see them so well, because they were open so wide. Come here, boy. Look what I dug up. I was afraid that if I didn't listen to him, he would start chasing after me. That was something I wanted to avoid at all costs. I got a bit closer, but kept a good distance between us. I didn't see anything, except for an empty hole. He returned to hitting the ground with his machete, occasionally taking sips from the bottle. I used this window of time to grab my dog and start walking away slowly, as to not notify him I was leaving. I took one final glance at the man. His head was dug deep in the hole. I was intrigued, so I kept on looking. I know, stupid of me. He finally retrieved his head from the ground. I was shocked when I saw him carrying a bone in his mouth. I have no idea what animal it belonged to, or even if it did belong to one. I had seen enough now. I started sprinting with my dog. As we ran, I heard him laughing, and then I saw something flying at me from the corner of my eye. It was that damn machete. It barely missed me. I heard him call out in frustration. God damn it! This made me run even faster. I knew the forest very well so I wasn't afraid of getting lost. I ripped through branches and bushes until I arrived out of that forest. I didn't stop sprinting until I got to the garage where my father was testing out lights on our tractor. I didn't tell him a single thing about the man since I was afraid he'd get angry and wouldn't allow me to walk Molly anymore. Needless to say though, I never went out to that forest alone again anyway. At the time this happened, I lived in Missouri. When I was about five or six years old, I was sound asleep in my bed one night. It had to be at least after midnight at this point. Very suddenly, I was awoken out of my sleep, only to see a strange man standing over me with his hands wrapped around my wrists. The moonlight slightly illuminated my room, and I could make out the man's face, sort of. 
mostly his thick mustache. I was overcome with fear in that moment and began to scream my head off. The man rushed out of my room immediately, and not even a few moments later, my parents rushed in to see what was wrong. I was crying my eyes out and told them what had just happened. My dad thoroughly searched the house, but nothing was found that night. My parents did their best to calm me down, and my mother slept by my side until I fell asleep. Later that very same night, even further into the evening, that same thing happened again. This time, though, he was a lot gentler with grabbing my wrists. I imagine he thought if he was a little more gentle, he would be able to kidnap me while I was asleep. I'll never forget the shriek I made in that moment. You can't even begin to imagine the fear. That person was somehow in my home once again and trying to take me away forever. Once again, he ran away. My parents let me sleep in their bed for the rest of the night. When I finally became a teenager, my mom and I were talking about that incident. She told me that apparently, while I was outside playing with my dad earlier that day, she was bathing my six-month-old brother when she'd noticed someone walk past the bathroom quietly as possible. At that point, alarm bells were going off in her head, of course. She then began to hear these strange noises coming from the bedroom. She wrapped my brother up in a towel and carried him in her arms. She went outside as fast as she could. She thought the man was trying to bait her to come inside alone. My father went into the house instead and checked everywhere, but there was no one to be found. My parents' theory is that they were somehow able to get in from the back door, which led to the unfinished basement. What creeps me out, though, is that he was so quiet. Everything in the home remained untouched when he intruded. I always think about what would have happened if I just slept through all of that. I could have easily been kidnapped, or even worse, killed. My parents wanted to get out of this house as soon as possible. Of course we didn't feel safe. They sold it ASAP and moved us into a two-bedroom apartment while our new house was being built elsewhere. I was very sad to move, of course, and I missed my friends a whole lot, but my safety was more important than anything else. So, heads up for right now. This story is actually supremely fucked up. The story is that I went on a website kind of like Facebook, but it wasn't exactly. I guess I'll call it Tea Time. It was around 2010, and I went on there basically religiously every day. I was quite young and also somewhat dumb. A 14-year-old female. It sounds like a cheesy-as-hell start, but it was actually quite terrible. As this cheesiness goes, I found a couple of friends on there. Around five who I became close with. We didn't instantly become friends, though. Gradually grew closer over time. They knew what country and state I lived in, but that was basically it. I was really scared of being stalked by people online. I knew basically just as much about them, because we were friends online, but that was about all. After a year, though, I got more close with one of the guys specifically. Things got more intimate, I guess I'd say. He lived all the way on the other side of the country, He'd been planning to meet me for a while, but I didn't quite trust him yet, you know? We were all supposedly around the same age, and had similar interests as well. I just happened to connect with this particular guy the most of all. Eventually, I stopped using tea time. I had school, and I realized something was kind of weird after one of them accidentally called me by my real name. I told them my name was some pseudonym or something, that made me so scared, I deleted that account right away and never logged back on. Then I completely forgot all about that messaging app. Well, what I hadn't seen in the meantime was all of the threatening messages sent to me over and over, telling me to get back on tea time or else. That person didn't seem to care about me at all. He told me my address, my full legal name, where I went to school. 
He then told me that he and the other guys had intentions of kidnapping me for their boss, some guy named Carlos or something. A very racist Mexican stereotype they'd crafted. I was so scared. I started skipping school, putting up cameras all over the place, wearing different clothes and even changing my hair. November 2012, they finally showed up at my house one day out of nowhere, a day I'd skipped school. They'd brought pistols with them, it seemed, and what looked to be a machete type of knife. I did what I thought was best at the time. I hid in the closet in my room and called the police right away. The faces they made while searching my house for me will haunt me to this day. They made me feel super insecure about myself while insulting me and told me all the crazy and sadistic things they would do to me if they found me. Cutting my skin open, breaking all of my fingers, shoving the knife up my ass. I was mortified. I was so scared in that moment I forced the lock on my closet so it would stay locked from the inside. When the police arrived, it took them five minutes to break me out. I was crying my eyes out, and I was more scared than I'd ever been. Somehow, the police weren't able to catch those guys. I never found my closure. I did find some further information on them, though, because of others who seemed to have similar problems. It turned out that each of these guys was apparently 40 years old. There was a guy that picked people who looked particularly young to pretend to be young girls and boys and try to befriend kids online. To this day, I still haven't told anyone really. Many times after, I'd skip school out of paranoia and try to play it off as just being sick. I did my best to change everything about me so they wouldn't recognize me again. I have extreme trust issues now. I feel like sharing this did help me get it a bit off my chest. Before then, I'd only told the police and other people involved in the investigation what happened to me. When people say to be careful on the internet, please be sure to keep that in mind. So this was a really weird experience that happened to me. I went out rock hounding solo today to a place my husband and I have gone to many times before. Everything seemed fairly normal when I arrived. It's a fairly secluded area of the creek with a rock bar in the middle and a small patch of woods to the left. There's a far denser forest off to the right. I crossed the creek and set up my gear on the rock bar. I grabbed a bag and started walking up along the creek. About 45 minutes into this, I kept on glancing up at the forest. I didn't know why at first, but I just kept on getting this eerie feeling. Every now and again, I'd hear a couple of thumps somewhere out there in the woods. But, you know, it's nature. I tried not to think too much of it. After about 15 minutes more, though, I suddenly heard a very quiet meow. I was so focused on pulling up clay that I instantly stood up. I was extremely confused. I couldn't have just heard a house cat meowing out here, could I? Ten minutes went by. I was now walking further up the creek, and damned would I be if I didn't hear it again. I stopped instantly. I'd for sure just heard a cat's meow. How strange. But something seemed really off about it. I started to feel real uneasy now. I turned around and headed back to my site. Something about the sound I'd heard wasn't quite right. It was like a matter-of-fact meow, if that makes sense. I don't know how else to explain it. About five minutes into the trek, I could hear that meowing sound behind me now. I was sweating like crazy because of the heat, but that instantly made me feel cold and clammy. The hair stood up on the back of my neck. I knew what I was supposed to be hearing, a single meow but it wasn't coming from a cat. The sound was now closer, and I could tell it sounded like someone imitating a cat's meow. I kept focused on getting back to my sight. Five minutes later, another meow from behind me. This is where I realized that things were getting really concerning now. And that sound was coming from the same distance behind me, no matter how far I kept walking, or how fast. Finally, I reached my sight once more. I pulled out my drinks and took a moment to rehydrate. 
That's when another cat's meow sounded right next to me. This time, I knew with everything in me, this was not a cat following me. I calmly gathered up my gear and began the trek across the creek to the path to my car. This time, right from behind my ear, a meow came. I sprinted across the creek and hunched down in a pit. I'd parked my car right next to the edge of the forest, and I was really starting to lose my shit now. I grabbed my keys and mace out, and put my gear on me so I could dive into my car and rearrange later. That's exactly what I did. I dove right in. I nearly shit myself, having to take the opportunity to find the courage and sprint out to my car. But I did so, and I hightailed it out of there as fast as possible. I want to hear your guys' thoughts on this. The rational answer is that someone was just screwing at me. But why would they be so far out into the woods? It was like 200 acres of forest. I just don't know. So I've been waiting a long time to tell the full story of the Whistler. This story requires many details, but is unexplainable, creepy, and 100% true. When I was about 8 years old, I was taking my dog for a walk through the neighborhood with my mother. It was maybe 11pm or so. We lived right next to a swampy woods area on the edge of our neighborhood in Lansing, Michigan. I remember it was very silent, and slightly windy as well. From somewhere down out in the swamp, we could hear someone whistling at us. It sounded sort of like a bird at first, but each whistle was different enough, with a lack of consistency made it sound human-like. I can't really even begin to describe it. My mom had this concerned, terrified look on her face. She grabbed my hand and said we should go back inside quickly. I didn't understand because I was too young, but seeing my mom freak out made me freak out too. After a while though, I just kinda forgot about it. Two years later, I was taking my dog out again, this time late at night. There was a large bush that could easily obscure a person behind it, right next to our front door. As I was finishing up our night walk, that whistling noise started again. Same pitches, same inconsistent human-like tones. As soon as I heard it, a chill went down my spine. I remembered that exact feeling of seeing my mom terrified, looking out into the swamp at something I couldn't see. I ran inside as fast as possible. The years continued to go by, and I thought about it less and less over time. I only told a handful of people, and it slipped my mind altogether. I mean, it happens so infrequently. Fast forward to last summer. I was now 24 and started dating my girl Sarah. We moved out to South Dakota for work. For Independence Day, we decided to go to Pierre, South Dakota and watch the fireworks along the bank of the Missouri River. There was a free camping spot just behind a hospital where you could pitch up your tent, hang out, and see the fireworks together up the river. We were near the end of the campground, and there were very few people around us. As it was getting dark, the fireworks began to pop off. They were pretty far away, so the illumination they brought us was very little. We actually had to sit right at the edge of the river to be able to see them. A giant thunderhead was moving in, and it seemed a storm was imminent. The air seemed almost electric, and the wind was now picking up. The atmosphere was quite eerie, to say the least. The police had herded all the other boats off of the river, and had left our area to do that elsewhere as well. Most of the other campers were walking along the riverbank to get a better view of the fireworks. Sarah and I just kind of stayed back, drinking PBR tall boys and kicking it. Suddenly, we began to hear the sound of a paddle methodically dipping into the water. We saw a figure steering a canoe about 20 meters offshore. Sarah decided to go get some more beers from the car, leaving me all alone to stare at this mystery person. All of a sudden, they started to whistle at me. My entire body was frozen, covered in goosebumps. It was that exact same whistling sound from my childhood, now more than a decade later. I looked over to that figure, 
it was much too dark to discern who it could be. They seemed to be wearing a big hat. When perpendicular to the shore from me, they stopped paddling altogether. They turned the canoe to face directly at me and began to whistle at me once more. I was so frightened I jumped up and shouted at them, Who are you? They didn't say anything, just whistled a couple of more lines, then turned the canoe 180 degrees and paddled all the way out of sight. I'm a videographer, so I already had my camera by my side and was taking video of the fireworks at that moment. As the canoe was almost out of sight, I grabbed my camera and got a shot of them whistling as they paddled away. When Sarah came back from getting beers, she was very confused as to why I was so freaked out now. When I explained, she freaked out a bit too. I was convinced we would both be murdered or something that night. How would this whistling person manage to follow me after 14 years all the way to South Dakota? Was it just a coincidence? Why were they whistling the exact same tune then? Who was that person and where were they going? So many questions were left unanswered. To this day, I'm more afraid of being outside in the dark where I might hear that whistling once again. I'm open to any explanations. I was recently reminded of an experience I had back in October. I thought my previous experience was my one and only weird backwoods experience, but I guess I was mistaken. Where I live, we have relatively few COVID cases. There were almost none back in the fall. Because of that, although there were certain restrictions still, we had more public health sanctioned freedoms than many other places. For example, at the time we were permitted to share our social bubble with one other household and travel within our region. My family and our fellow bubble family decided to take advantage of this by going on a fall getaway together. We rented two side-by-side -side cabins in a beautiful waterfront wooded area and had a lovely relaxing weekend. Although there were other cabins nearby, they were all unoccupied and we saw no other people there, though we did hear a dog barking a few times somewhere not far off. On our final night there, my son decided to sleep in the other cabin with his bubble buddies. Around 11 p.m. he called me over, asking for some forgotten thing. It was very dark that night, and there were certainly no street lights in this deeply wooded cabin area. I grabbed my flashlight and began to walk the short distance to the neighboring cabin to deliver whatever it was he'd forgotten. While on my walk back, though, I began to hear a whistling. It was a very human-sounding whistle, the kind someone would make when calling back a dog or something. It sounded very close to me. Shining my light around into the woods, though, I couldn't see anybody there. I heard it once more. I'd assumed it was someone whistling for the dog we'd heard earlier, so I didn't think much of it in that moment. A short time later, another call came from next door. It seemed my son couldn't settle down and wanted to come back over to our cabin. This time, my husband and I walked over together. We collected our child and his things and said goodnight to our bubble family and walked back. We heard the same whistle again now, multiple times. It seemed to be on the dirt road just ahead of us, gradually moving away. My husband commented their dog must have gotten loose or something, and the owner was out looking for it. Inside our cabin, we continued to hear that whistling, coming at irregular intervals every two to four minutes or so. At first, it would be quite loud and seem right next to us. Then it would gradually grow fainter, then stop as though they'd move completely out of earshot. Then it would circle around again, coming from the other direction, getting louder as they moved past our cabin, fading once more into the distance. This happened over and over again. Still not thinking that much of it, my husband climbed into the loft to go to sleep, while I started to pack for the trip home the next day. Our son was sleeping in a little room on the main floor to the left of the front door, and the small window in his room was cracked open just a bit to let in some unseasonably warm night air. I was sitting by that window, quietly gathering up his scattered things, when the whistling once again drew closer. 
This time, though, instead of fading as they passed by, it sounded very close and incredibly loud, as though this person was just outside my son's window now. The blinds were down, but I was absolutely sure I could make out someone standing on the front porch outside. I leapt to the front door and flung it open. I threw on the porch light, ready to tell off this prankster on our doorstep, only to see nobody was there. I grabbed my flashlight and took a few steps out past that circle of light. I began to hear the whistling again. I thought better of this and retreated back inside. I locked up the cabin tight. I closed and latched all the windows and lowered all the blinds. If someone was creeping around outside our cabin, I didn't want them looking in at us from the darkness. Deciding I now did not want to leave my sleeping son downstairs by himself, I settled down on the sofa with a book. The whistling continued around our cabin. Between each sound, I would try to convince myself it must just be a bird or an animal, only to hear it once more and be absolutely certain it was a human being. Around 1.30 a.m., my husband suddenly leapt up and started to get dressed. I asked him what he was doing. I'm gonna go find out whoever that is and ask them why they've been doing this for hours, he said, obviously quite angry. I was horrified. My husband is a pretty big guy. I was as curious as he was, but I felt deep in my gut that it would not be safe for him to go out and confront that person. I insisted he simply keep me company for the night, and thankfully he did. I sat there vigil, listening to the intermittent whistles all around us. It was at least an hour until I got so exhausted I dozed off on the sofa. When I woke up, it was the next morning. The sun was now peeking around the blinds, and the whistling had long since stopped. I cautiously peered outside, half expecting to see some sort of evidence of a nighttime intruder. There was nothing there. A while later, we wandered next door, coffee mugs in hand to get our friend's take on this mystery whistler. Amazingly, they'd not heard a single thing that night despite the fact we'd heard that sound over and over around our cabin. Clearly, that person would have had to have passed by them to go back around. We couldn't understand how they'd not heard it. I guess maybe they hadn't done it when they were going around them. At checkout, I asked the woman at the kiosk down the road about this. She gave me this real strange look and said she didn't have any idea what I was talking about. When I got home, I searched for audios of bird calls common to the area. Even ones not common in the area, in hopes of finding that same whistle somewhere on there. Nothing I found was even close. We still don't know what that was that night, circling for hours and stopping just outside our cabin door. My boyfriend Jason, 27 and male, and I, 23 and female, went on a month-long camping trip to multiple states. Everything had been going really well, actually, all the way until October 9th at least. We decided to ditch a campground reservation and instead randomly pitch our tent near Albion Basin in the Uinta Mountains, Alta, Utah, not far off the trailhead. We parked our car around 3 p.m. at the Albion Basin campground. It was closed for the season. Admittedly, the atmosphere was a little bit tense because this was our first dispersed camping attempt and we had no proper backpacking gear. Upon arrival, we realized the area we wanted to pitch our tent in was about two miles uphill. At this point, we started to express regret. I was wondering why we had a planned campsite in Nephi, Utah that we decided to just skip on a whim. After grumping around a bit though and having a large lunch to avoid packing food, we packed our backpacks with the best gear we had to get going through the night as it was going to be 25 degrees Fahrenheit. We set out up the trail, seeing the occasional family or couple heading back down the mountain. As we trudged on further, we both started to feel a bit strange, though. We didn't really even know why we were doing this. We could have just gotten a hotel instead of trying to play backpackers for the night, but we both felt like we had something to prove on our trip, I guess. So, we continued nonetheless. Fast forward, and we finally made it up to Creekret Lake. Totally empty. 
nothing like the pictures. It was actually kind of eerie how quiet it was. Whatever. We kept hiking up and up in an attempt for seclusion and flat land. When we finally stumbled upon a decent clearing, I could see a small cave in the distance. I pointed it out to Jason to see if it seemed like a good place to stay and check out. He said it seemed like a small animal crawl space. No biggie. We set up as nightfall was quickly approaching, played some cards, bundled up together, and decided to go to bed early around 8.30. We planned to leave as soon as possible in the morning, maybe 5 a.m. or so. We both settled down and eventually fell asleep, but after what felt like 30 minutes, I woke up abruptly at 11.24. I woke up with a feeling I'd never experienced before. I shot wide awake, scared but unprovoked. There was no way I was going to be able to fall back asleep, even though I could sleep anywhere and sleep through the night usually. Jason was still snoring though, so I let him be and just laid there, alert, trying to listen to anything I could make out. There was nothing. It was particularly silent. Around 30 minutes later, Jason woke up as well, much to my delight as I didn't want to be awake alone anymore. I told him I couldn't sleep. He suggested I just rest my eyes, as we were leaving soon enough anyway. I didn't want to be a baby and say I was scared, though. This was very short-lived, as Jason found himself unable to fall back asleep either. We ended up laying there together, just listening to the sounds of the night. Eventually, I ended up blurting out that I was extremely scared. We agreed it was fine for us to just stick it through the night as now it was already 2.30. We had a small axe and a pellet gun for protection, so he tried to reassure me I didn't need to be frightened. Not even five full minutes later, though, we were still wide awake, when Jason's head perked up so fast my heart nearly jumped out of my chest. What is it? I whispered. Shh, listen. I shit you not, I could hear the sound of gravel crunching on someone's boots as they walked around our tent, stopped, and then walked to the side I was sitting on. I felt the blood drain out of my face in an instant. In real time, this all occurred in no more than ten seconds, but my mind flashed a million thoughts a millisecond. I was convinced it was a ranger coming to arrest us for camping here or something. I called out feebly. H hello I could hear the footsteps moving around us once more. Within two to three seconds of hearing this, Jason grabbed the gun and burst out of the tent, for any chance to confront this person. We knew exactly what we were hearing. But there was nobody there. As soon as Jason got out of the tent, me bursting after him, there was nothing there. We'd heard someone walking around us so clearly, but somehow they'd managed to sneak away and hide in just a moment. Hardly exchanging two words, we packed up the stuff we could, looking over our shoulders terrified. We could feel we were being watched. We booked it back down the mountain, with only the moonlight guiding our way. We were too scared to turn off our flashlights. It was the worst 20 to 30 minutes of my life, half expecting to look over my shoulder and find some person stalking us through the woods. When we made it to our car, we locked the doors up first thing, and started the descent out of the mountains, speechless and scared out of our minds. We reached town at about 3.30, and slept in a well-lit parking lot of a grocery store, We've obviously since discussed what happened that night, and we're both haunted by the memories of those footsteps. I once had a bit of a self-rescue I had to do in the Laramie Peak Range. I lost all my gear, map, and shelter in a windstorm. Took me a few days to get out and had a couple of deeply unpleasant experiences along the way. This isn't that story, though. It sucked ass, but it wasn't all that scary. I managed to keep a cool head. Typically, that's who I am, the person who stays calm in a crisis. I mention that to let you know how unusual this was to make me freak out and completely lose my cool. This time, I had all my gear, but I just couldn't keep it together. There are a lot of cool little trails in Colorado, some well known to the public and some that you'd only know if you were a local. 
There are mountains and forests for days out there. In 2013, we got some torrential downpours in September along the eastern slope. It was squelchy as shit for a while, and a glorious mushrooming boom happened because of it. I love mushrooms. My favorite thing is foraging. My absolute favorite is Boletus rubriceps. The conditions weren't exactly right, but I thought, why not give it a shot, you know? The area I like to forage in, I say it did have some native hazel, some actually fruiting manzanita, watermelon berry, currants, rose chips, raspberries, strawberries, frequently oysters, morels, hawk wings, puff balls, milky caps, chicken of the woods, chicken of the road, chanterelles too. Lots of different kinds of mushrooms I've found in the region. For someone like me, it's a wonderful paradise. I could disperse to camp there easily. That was where I went after these storms. No brainer. Now it was fall. Even if somewhat early fall, I knew that Yogi and Boo Boo were going to be out stuffing it for the winter. I carried my bear spray because of this, and my uncle's lever action 44 Mag Henry. My girlfriend at the time was supposed to come too, but she couldn't get off work. Solo it was going to be. I figured I could practice some firecraft, maybe build a chair or a smoker or something, and just have a nice few days to myself. I went up early in the morning, hiked about seven miles in, set up my shelter, and set up to enjoy the rare luxury of a real fire in Colorado. A while later, I started to do my stuff, set up a couple rods with bells, got out my baskets to forage, and set up my dryer and its shelter far away from my sleeping tarp. I was squelching around with my foraging gear out in a few minutes and having an absolute blast. I was marching happily along, pretty much oblivious to anything else until dusk. Then I pulled out my headlamp and kept going well past what I should have. Damn did I get a good haul though. It was an incredible spread. I left plenty out for the woodland critters to enjoy too. I got back to my camp, started cleaning and drying the mushrooms, and didn't get to my dinner until about 1 in the morning. I caught two brook trout of reasonable size as well. Got them, let them hang out in a bug net near the creek for the next day. I figured it was cold enough that it would be okay. I got back to my little dinky tarp shelter around 3 a.m. I went back inside, toweled off, and passed out. A day very happily spent. I woke up at around 10 a.m. or so the next day. The woods were eerily silent. No birds, no sound of bugs, not even the wind in the branches. Just the sound of a nearby brook gurgling and that was it. Usually, there'd be at least some animal sounds. I decided to be cautious when going about my business this time. My camp was exactly as I had left it, except for two things. First, there was a branch about two feet long, thick as my wrist, laid against a tree my pack was tied to. It had been gnawed on on both ends, sort of like a beaver, but the teeth marks looked different. I'd heard of beavers doing this before, but I'd never seen it myself. Somebody had to have left it there, but to what end, I had no idea. Unsettling? Sure. Freaky? Not really. I wasn't scared. Actually, my first thought was I must have accidentally picked it up and forgotten about it or something. Maybe I'd been playing around with it while fishing earlier or something like that and just forgotten. I went to collect those fish, speaking of. Hopefully, they'd still be there and not rotten or nasty yet. I got into sight of them, or rather, the bug nets they were in, and of course, they were gone. Bug net was loose but intact and empty. The fish heads were still hanging there, oddly enough, but the rest of the fish were gone. Okay, maybe another person stealing my things then. Somebody was really giving me the Scooby-Doo treatment. I had a bunch of charcoal left over from the fire. It was a nice big rock next to my fishing spot, so I scrawled a message on there. If you're hungry, next time stop by and say hi. I'll share my meal with you instead. I put an arrow pointing roughly towards my camp. I was more grumpy than anything. I guess they'd left that weird branch as a trade for my fish or something. I was very confused. I went to check on my collection of precious shrooms and my berry cooler. Lo and behold, everything was untouched. However, I hadn't swept out any of the debris beneath it. I mean, why bother? Well now, there was nothing underneath my tarp. It had been cleaned for me. 
weird again. I started looking more seriously for some tracks and found nothing. I wasn't here to play junior detective though. I was here to frolic in the woodlands to my heart's content and collect unreasonable amounts of mushrooms. God damn it. I shook it off and went back to the creek to set up my lines again, only to notice my bells were now gone too. I couldn't remember if they had been there that morning or not. I assumed they must have been taken the previous night. I had only tied the rods to trees after all, so it was easy grabbing. I went back to my tarp, still confused as ever. I made some food, coffee, and decided to still go about my business. Now, here's a somewhat embarrassing thing I do. I know to make noise in the woods if bears are around, and I like to sing. It isn't the same as singing well, mind you. By and large, I sung whatever I'd been playing on the speakers at my job. Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, Florence and the Machine, Lord, you get the picture. Don't judge me. This stuff is designed to be catchy. I went back on my rounds and find some more rare mushrooms. A rare treat, actually. Some fire morels and ash morels. I was really excited. Hundreds of them. Super late for them to show up in season, too. They were my absolute favorite. I set out collecting some and kept myself company by singing. I was singing Bad Romance or something. All of a sudden, out in the woods, I heard what sounded like someone trying to harmonize with me. I'm a bass. This was a higher tenor or alto voice, muted by the distance a little. It was also completely and undeniably wrong. Scratchy, almost buzzy, weird syllables, clipped and disjointed, a little off-key and off-rhythm as well. Basically, I'm pointing out it was very uncanny valley sounding. I shut up immediately and froze. The singing continued for a moment, and then stopped as well. I was now experiencing a little bit of what my friends called pucker butt. I started to slowly reach back behind me for my Henry on its strap. I heard a sudden yelp or something, then some rustling from somewhere uphill of me behind the tree line. I took a few breaths, assuming I'd just freaked out the other party as much as they did me. I tried to force myself to relax. I kept these small binoculars on me. I took them out and scanned the tree line, but I couldn't see anything. This was probably whoever had taken my fish and my bells. Someone squatting out here in the woods, maybe. I was trying to keep my head on a swivel, but if they were going to be a problem, I feel like they would have already confronted me. They could have even taken a pot shot at me from the woods if they wanted to. It occurred to me finally that I may have just been hearing a weird echo or something. I convinced myself of this to give myself a bit more peace and calm than I had a few minutes before. Although, that didn't explain the yelp though. I guess it could have been a normal animal doing something in the woods though. Hooray for rationalizing things away. I decided that was enough mushrooms for now though. I didn't want to be drying them after dark after this experience. I headed back to camp and got to making that happen. Am I a moron? Maybe. Possibly. I really didn't want to go home though. I was really having the time of my life here. I'd grown up in high deserts my whole life, and getting to see so much green that late in the year was a real treat. I wanted to stay. Creepy bullshit be damned. I'd had moments where my brain had tricked me in the past. I talked myself into believing that was happening once more. I kept on singing to myself, this time a bit more quietly than before though. Then it happened again though. From somewhere a bit closer this time, that weird buzzy higher voice joined in. I felt the bottom drop out of my stomach. I know this probably just sounds creepy because I thought I was alone, but it's hard to convey just how off sounding this voice was too. They were fairly close to what I had been singing but like it was coming out of a culvert or something. Just buzzy and clicking and hoarse sounding, like something was wrong with their throat. I was not having this at all. I shut up immediately again. This time I pulled my gun off my back and searched around me. This had to be someone fucking with me now. Not unheard of for good foraging spots, but this was my first time. The singing continued for a moment again after I stopped. Uphill, further in the woods, and definitely in a direction I hadn't been in yet. I called out and announced myself. I asked them to answer me. Nothing. Complete silence now. Since I was listening a bit closer too, I noticed it once more. No animal sounds. No bugs buzzing. My head felt a little bit hazy. I was beginning to get really concerned now. 
It even looked like a storm might be rolling in too. Bingo. I headed a bit over to a clearing nearby, and for sure I could see a storm rolling in. As always, it was hard to judge the speed. It wouldn't be a bad idea to reconfigure my tarp though, and consider taking shelter early. Again, now with a little more peace with the voice and presence gone. I figured any more bullshit from my neighbor in a bad thunderstorm was going to be far less likely. I went back to my fishing rods and looked out. I had caught an even bigger trout than the night before. I collected some water for the next day, packed up my forging stuff, lashed it all to a trunk, and decided to call it there before dusk and the storm was on its way in. I set up my tarp lower to the ground, a more wind-resistant configuration. I set up a spare older one as a kind of rain fly over the entrance as well. It's worth noting this was a fairly thin setup facing the clearing, since the worst of the wind would be coming from there. It pretty much blocked my view. I did another Widowmaker check though. All good, made some hot cocoa and tucked in, just as it was starting to come down. And it came down real hard. I had to put in earplugs to keep my ears from being hurt by the lightning. It was very frequent and loud. I didn't stay particularly dry, and I didn't get much sleep either. It was already one of the most unpleasant and awe-inspiring nights I'd ever had in the wild. Somewhere in the middle of the night, though, I thought I felt something bounce off my tarp, kind of behind me. Not weird, it happens sometimes in storms. A few minutes later, though, I saw something else. A stone, about the size of my fist, bouncing off the tarp, off the rain fly and landing right in front of me. I turned my headlamp on. Sure as shit, it was a rock. Not just any rock either, a rock from the river. Rocks don't just fall off trees. If this storm had picked this round one up from the river, it should have been airborne. Another one, a few minutes later. Somebody was throwing rocks at me. What should I do? Investigate? I had my gun on me, and if shit was gonna go down, I was about as ready as I could ever be. I turned my headlamp back off. Then I got treated to pretty much the most awe-inspiring amount of lightning I'd ever seen in my life. The sky was lit up for seconds at a time. My earplugs couldn't even protect me from the thunder. My ears were ringing. I kept seeing the trees from the edge of the tree line and the clearing projected in shadowy form over my rain fly, dancing this way and that. I couldn't look away. At one moment though, as the lightning was flashing, I clearly saw what looked just like a person hiding in the tree line, outlined against the trees and my rain fly by the lightning. They were walking strangely, not running from cover to cover, but kind of strolling back and forth like a drunk person, trying to be sneaky. The silhouette wasn't bulky. For some reason, I got the impression they weren't wearing clothes at all. The figure stopped. Whether or not they were facing me, I couldn't quite tell you, but I felt watched right now and very exposed. The figure stood there behind a tree, swaying back and forth, maybe being pushed around by the winds even. I got little glimpses here and there as the lightning flashed. They didn't appear to be doing anything, but standing there and staring at my tent. It was pretty freaky. I readied my gun in front of me. I then had another rock land on my tarp, bounce off and land right in front of me. This was a bad moment. The lightning stopped for just a moment. The thunder died down too. I had a horrible, slow realization that there might be more than one person out there. Then I heard cutting through the ringing in my ears and the momentary silence, clear as it had been earlier, but sounding much closer. The singing of that song I had been singing before. Then it was nothing. I looked back and realized the figure was now not being projected by the lightning anymore. Now that there was a lull, there was complete darkness. I just remember thinking I was fucked to myself in my head. Basically, I was going to have to crawl out of my tarp to get on my feet even. There was no way I was going to be able to stay there anymore. I counted down from ten. I rushed out as quickly as I could and readied my gun once more. I yelled out into the forest. You better stop messing with me. I'm armed. I was not in a good headspace. I was as freaked out as I could have been at this point. This was not that long after another creepy experience in the woods. I was about ready to shit myself. I looked around the back of my tent with my light and didn't see anything. Nobody. Just rain raining down. I walked a bit further. I couldn't see anybody still. 
I could clearly see into the clearing until my light got swallowed up by the rain. I walked around the edge of my little camp, patrolling and sticking close to my tent. I couldn't make out any figures. I wish I could say I checked out the tree line too, but I was too scared. I tried to yell again, but my voice was locked up in my throat. All of a sudden, another rock flew and landed right next to my foot. Bounced off, actually. I won't lie to you, I lost it in that moment. I fired my gun into the dirt about ten feet in front of me. I could hear some rustling out in the woods, uphill from me yet again. I yelled some dumb panicked bullshit. I ducked back into my tarp and wrapped up as much as I could huddled up with my gun. Eventually the storm broke, followed by dawn. I packed up my shit and rushed out of there. I was pretty shaky. It took me a while to get all my various gear and my shelter as well. I took a few moments to look at the stones that had been thrown at me. They were really thick. When I went to grab the last of my things, I noticed there were two little sections of wood with chewed ends, stripped just like before, leaning against the trunk right next to my tent. Nope, not okay. It took me a second to get my things. I was that freaked out that I was now afraid of simple sticks. One the first night, two the second? No, fuck that. I got myself under control, only to notice a powerful sense of being watched. I shook off the cover, packed it in a dry bag, and turned around to get the hell out of there. Then I saw a whole, very dead rabbit on the back edge of my camp. The rain had washed off any leakage that would have been on it, but the carcass was splayed out there. Like somebody had thrown it at me, and it had bounced off. It was fresh enough it didn't stink. I won't paint you any more of the picture. I was instantly and totally numb. At that point, I just panicked and fled from there. I readied my gun the entire way too, and jogged pointing it out into the forest until I couldn't anymore. I breathlessly walked the rest of the way back to my car. I got in, drove about 20 minutes, and then had to pull over and throw up as I had a panic attack. I've never been back there alone, and definitely not unarmed. Like many, I've been quarantining in my house in California, mostly spending the time hopping on work calls and gaining a bunch of weight. One night last month, though, it was around 10.30 and I was simply eating dinner. I live in a rural area where houses are spaced much farther apart. The main town square has got to be at least two miles from where I live. That's where the police department is as well. So suddenly, I get a knock at the door, Odd at this hour, but I opened it anyways. I was expecting a package at the time. Instead of a package though, there were three men dressed in these dirty yellow hazmat suit things with face shields as well. I was obviously taken aback. I mumbled something like, uh, hello? One guy was holding a clipboard and introduced themselves as a disinfection team sent by the county. Groups of them had apparently been going around the towns in that county to inspect the houses and make sure they were sanitized or whatever. I was not buying this. I asked them to give me a moment. I shut the door and called my neighbor. I asked him about this disinfection team. He told me it must be a scam and to ask for a warrant or call the cops right away. I went back to the door only to see the men were now gone. I walked out into my driveway, completely baffled. I glanced up and down the street. No cars in sight either. Just the warm night air. I contemplated calling the police for a moment, but I didn't think it was worth it. I went back inside and simply locked all my windows and doors instead, heading upstairs to watch some TV. About an hour later, still watching TV, I began to hear things falling over in my backyard on the patio. I heard it clear as day because the patio was right below my bedroom window which had been left wide open. I was too scared to check it out myself. Instead, I stuck my head out the window to look around a bit. I nearly died on the spot when I saw one of those same men in the hazmat suits messing with my back door. I reacted as quickly as I could. Hey asshole, the cops are already on their way. That sure got his attention. He yelled something unintelligible and hopped the backyard fence. I saw those two other fuckers running from around the side of my house. They jumped the fence too, 
and ran off into the woods beyond my home. I picked up my phone from the nightstand and called my local police, explaining the situation. Because of the bright yellow in their figures, I could see them disappearing farther out into the woods. The cops came and we made a creepy discovery. The two guys who had been at the side of my house had been trying to pry my dining room window open with a crowbar. I asked them if they could check for fingerprints. I shit you not. One of the officers responded with, What, you think we're the CIA or something? That really pissed me off. It seemed small town police officers really don't give a shit. At least the ones where I live don't. After I insisted, it turned out the men had been wearing gloves anyways, so I guess it didn't matter. Let this be a lesson, and I hope no one else will fall victim to this kind of scam. This happened three nights ago, and I'm going crazy trying to figure out what it's about. I had just moved into a new apartment one month ago. I'm still unpacking even and settling in. I'd been using my parents' address as my mailing address. They lived a few towns over, about 20 minutes away. I'd been doing so all my life, pretty much. Just three nights ago, my parents called me at 2 a.m., freaked out, and proceeded to tell me this story. Apparently, at 1 in the morning, someone began frantically banging on their front door and repeatedly ringing their doorbell. My stepdad walked downstairs and opened the door, leaving the front door locked and closed. There was a man standing outside, who looked to be in his thirties, a black hoodie on with the hood pulled up all the way over his face. He didn't have any distinguishing features, facial hair or tattoos. The only thing my stepdad said was that he looked to be Hispanic. Neither of my parents recognized the man. The man started by saying this, I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm looking for my full name. My stepdad played dumb and asked him who that was. The man proceeded to state my full name again and told them that my boyfriend was worried because I didn't come home that night. He claimed to be a friend of my boyfriend and told my stepdad they were both out looking for me, worried because I hadn't showed up. I don't have a boyfriend. I live by myself with my three dogs and haven't been in a relationship in quite a long time. Here's the weirdest part though. My stepdad asked the guy what boyfriend he was talking about. The man told him the exact full name of a boyfriend I'd had when I was in 10th grade, nearly 20 years ago. He said my high school boyfriend's name a few more times to ensure my stepdad heard him and repeated that they were very worried about me. Was my stepdad sure I was not inside? At this point, of course, my stepdad was weirded out. He slammed the door and locked it in the guy's face, but the man didn't leave. He lingered in front of my parents' house for several minutes, smoking cigarettes and calling someone on the phone. Finally, my parents called the cops. About five minutes before the police arrived, the man walked down to a dead end on their block and drove away in a nondistinct silver car. The car also didn't have a license plate. My parents filed a police report, but nothing else happened. After I heard this story, I'm going nuts over the weird details. How would someone know who I dated nearly 20 years ago? And what would the motive be of making up a story that included that weird detail about my past? I've not been in contact with that particular guy in over a decade. Yesterday, I decided to message him on Facebook to see if this had anything to do with him. I told him the whole story and he was just as confused as I was. He even claimed to have no part in it and showed me proof of what he was doing as well. I'm at a complete loss. I'm also really freaked out some strange man is going through so much trouble at 1am to search for me. Any insight or ideas would be greatly appreciated. Thankfully, nothing weird has happened since then. I finally feel ready to share my very creepy and uncomfortable encounter. This has been a few years since this happened, but to this day, I feel sick just thinking about that night. When I was in my very early 20s or so, I lived in some pretty shitty apartments. Pretty cheap too because of this. 
They were known for being a little bit sketchy for the area even. There was this one neighbor that seemed to be listening to James Brown and Motown, so even though he seemed a bit off, I thought to myself, how weird could he be? He's chilling to some really classic old music, surely he can't be that bad a guy. I'd hear him blasting his music and having loud conversations through the walls, but then again, we both had studio apartments that were touching. I would just play my own music to not hear his stuff so loudly. One night, he was drinking quite a lot. He seemed to have his girlfriend around or something. You could hear them being belligerent, but nothing that seemed out of the ordinary. At least for him, I suppose. It wasn't too late yet, so I headed out for the night with some friends, while my boyfriend at the time stayed in. I got dropped off around 1am or so. As we were driving into the lot, from afar I could see my neighbor outside, looking like he was hiding in between some cars in the apartment or something. Okay, that was pretty weird. Whatever though, this guy was just kinda creepy anyways. At that point, my friends were more weirded out than I was actually. I didn't think that much of it. This guy was always doing some weird shit. I had one of them drop me off near the entrance because it was easier for them to leave that way. That was until they started to drive away. I walked up to go into my apartment, which I had to pass by his first. I swear my heart dropped out of my chest. I noticed he was still standing by them, but now his body was hidden behind the bush that was in between our apartments. As I approached, it seemed like he thought maybe I hadn't seen him yet because it was so dark out. He was standing as still as a statue, like he was trying not to be seen. I waved and mumbled high to let him know he wasn't fooling anyone. I was not going to pretend at this point I couldn't see him. I didn't want him to try anything, since no one was out on a weekday at this hour. At that point, after acknowledging he was there, he stepped out from behind the bush and came into the dim porch light. Never in my life have I locked onto someone's eyes like that. My heart's racing even as I type this. His eyes were widened, dark, and fully dilated like he was just a wild animal. He looked like an absolute lunatic, if I were to express his energy well. He didn't say anything, but he gave me the most bone-chilling look. I ran into my apartment as fast as possible. My boyfriend was drowsy since it was late, but he did say the neighbor's music was loud and continued for some time. He heard a lot of noise and arguing earlier, but he hadn't really thought that much of it. That night, all night, we heard thumps coming from his apartment, and it also sounded like furniture was being moved. It weirded me out, knowing he was still awake and in that crazed state I'd viewed him in, almost primal. The next morning, I heard cops banging on his door and was partially relieved to see them. I was also super scared to see why they were there in the first place. They took him away in handcuffs shortly after, demanding to be let in. They asked me when the last time I had talked to him or seen him was. I told them about that night. The arguing, the noises, the frightening encounter, the thumping all night. What I found out during the next day will make my stomach turn forever. I was told this from the groundskeeper. Details I'll keep more simple since the act was so horrendous. The Motown James Brown listening neighbor brutally murdered his girlfriend that night dismembered parts of her, and dragged the rest of her body near the train tracks, which so happened to be directly behind our apartment. It hit me that the cold, primal, and wide-eyed look I'd seen in that man was the look of a person who'd just taken another human being's life and was worried I'd noticed he'd done it, in such a vicious and disgusting way, too. I felt so sad for that woman, who definitely did not deserve to go like that. She was always quiet and so sweet, and seemed a bit down on her luck. She was always asking for cigarettes whenever I encountered her. To this day, my stomach turns, thinking about how close I was to death, quite literally. He could have ambushed me out of insanity, since he was just waiting in the darkness when I walked up. Basically, to all of you who follow their intuition and gut feeling, listen to it. If you have a bad feeling about someone, even if they seem completely harmless, just stay a safe distance and be wary of them. 
I moved into a different apartment right after. It was just too much thinking about what happened that night. That neighbor went to jail, of course. I saw his booking photo, where he looked even more scary. I just hope he stays in jail for a long time, where he truly belongs. After listening to some human trafficking stories elsewhere, I can't help but feel incredibly uneasy. My heart is racing at the thought of what we might have avoided. Stay vigilant, both men and women. For reference, my boyfriend is about 6 foot 3 and 275 slash 300 pounds. He's very stocky and has a military style. He used to be in the military. Usually he just wears a shirt with some guns on it in some way and has a very thick beard. This is somewhat important for the story, actually. About three years ago, my boyfriend and I moved into a house with a couple of roommates near downtown in a big city of Michigan. I had sent him to the store for some staples while I started unpacking. He texted me just after arriving, saying he had the weirdest thing happen in the parking lot, but he would tell me when he got home. Ten minutes later, he texted again, saying he was super creeped out and jokingly told me, if I'm not on my way in five minutes, please send help. This was normal for his kind of humor. When he got home, he told me that on his way in from the parking lot, a man had stopped him offering several compliments on his beard. It happened quite a bit from guys, so he didn't really think that much of it at first. The man seemed to be dressed as if he were a lawyer or a real estate agent or something. Nice shoes, nice watch, very clean cut. He didn't seem suspicious at all. My boyfriend said thanks and began to walk inside. The guy continued walking with him, you know, asking all those questions, where he was from, what he did for a living, if he had kids or a wife. His gut lit up like fireworks, and after working in mental health for a bit, he knew to trust it. He made up some answers and told him to have a nice day. The man told him, if you're ever interested in a new line of work, you're just the kind of guy we're looking for. My boyfriend continued walking without responding and didn't look back. Only a few minutes later, he noticed the same man was now in the store and was appearing in all the same aisles as him. Whenever my boyfriend would notice him, he would immediately turn around and go the other way. At one point, the point he texted me, he was sure the man was secretly snapping photos of him from the other end of an aisle. We both commented on this craziness and said, that's some trafficking shit right there. We let it go though, as it was now over and no one really wanted to believe it. Days later, we ran to the store again to pick up some late night snacks. We parked the car what felt like miles from the store and began walking in. Thankfully, I don't really startle easily when we're out together because we both conceal carry and if someone tried to attack us, we're decently prepared. Still though, I jumped when a man's voice suddenly yelled out my boyfriend's name and added, and his pretty wife too. My boyfriend told me to keep walking and not hesitate. Thankfully, I knew what he meant. I hauled my ass into the entryway of the store. I watched the man walk up to my boyfriend and start talking with him while watching for any suspicious people or cars around them. When they were almost inside, I walked in, too, next to him and started chatting with the greeter so the man didn't get a chance to talk to me. The man showed up in all the aisles we were in and at one point pretended to be texting on his phone but was clearly taking photos of us. We didn't get to finish getting snacks. Instead, we left right away. I waited with the greeter as my boyfriend grabbed the car so I didn't have to walk through the dark lot. After that, I was in the gym every day at the same time due to my work schedule and usually had my girl roommate with me. Today, though, I was alone for a quick and light lifting session. I wasn't even a minute in, though, when that exact same guy walked in. I had never seen him there before. Instantly, I felt like vomiting. I texted my boyfriend to let him know, but he was now away on military, so he was now panicking from a distance unable to do anything. The man wasn't in gym attire, and he didn't have any equipment with him either. We were also at the gym furthest from that area from before, so I have no idea why he would have chosen to go to this particular one 
unless he was a really big fan of this gym for whatever reason. The man came over and tried to talk to me. I politely said hello back, but tried to ignore him. He said a few more things, and a guy a few machines over, I think could tell I was in a bit of trouble. He came over and pretended to be my friend, asking if I was ready to go. I said yes and tried to grab up my things. The creepy man then asked me where my husband was off to. I pretended not to hear him, as I kept on walking. When I came out after finishing my session, the man seemed to be gone. My new fake best friend was waiting on the bench outside the locker room. He said the man had waited around for a while, but finally left. He had let the staff know what happened. They said the man wasn't even a member. He had told them he came there to pick up his girlfriend. My new friend walked me to my car, and I switched gyms after. Thankfully, we now live far, far away from the city, and I've never encountered that guy again. Neither has my boyfriend. Honestly, I believe they might have been trying to recruit him to make big money selling women or something and that I was just a bonus woman to sell. Thank God for kind strangers who stood up to that guy and saved me. Those kinds of people will never realize how important they are in the world. I used to fight with my parents a lot as a teenager. That led to them kicking me out once I had graduated high school. I was almost 19 at that point. For me, that wasn't much of a problem. I had my own job, my own cheap car, and my friend's parents had a spare bedroom. They were willing to let me rent out for a while. It worked out just fine for me. This being said, I will change all the names. Let's call my friend Kelly and her mom Lena. Her dad is Kenneth. Kenneth and Lena had a lot of weird friends due to the fact they were quite fierce partiers. A lot of these friends were genuinely nice people, just a little bit weird. You could tell they had issues such as drugs or criminal pasts. But none of them were bad or mean or creepy or anything like that. There was one particular guy though that was just beyond weird. Just someone who, even though I didn't know him at all, he made my skin crawl the moment I looked at him. We'll call him Joey. I came home from work one day and the only person there at our house was Joey. As soon as I walked in, he said hello, then made some comment about how beautiful I was. I don't consider myself good-looking in the slightest, so I just kind of said thanks and walked off to start doing my normal routine. As I was making my lunch and cleaning up my mess, I could feel someone staring at me from behind. It was Joey. He'd followed me into the kitchen and was now blocking the only doorway just standing there watching me. I asked him if I could get him anything, but he shook his head and continued to watch me. This made me very uncomfortable, of course. I kind of shoved him out of the way and fled from my room. I locked the door until I heard everyone else get home. Joey finally left around dinner time. I thought it was fine and went about my nightly routine and went to bed as usual. He must have come back at some point, though because he was sitting at the breakfast table when I went down to get my cereal. Again, the whole time he just stared daggers at me, so I took my food to my room instead. Friday night rolled around. Lena, Kenneth, and Kelly told me they were going to throw this huge party, and I should invite whoever I wanted. I just had a gut feeling, though, that Joey was going to be there. I invited the most intimidating male person I could think of, my neighbor Charles. He was a pretty huge guy, around six foot five or so. He was also covered nearly head to toe in tattoos and happened to be an ex-Hell's Angel. He was the type that, unless provoked, wouldn't hurt anybody. I explained by inviting him the day before about how Joey was behaving. What he told me scared the shit out of me. Turns out he actually knew Joey. Apparently, he was on the run from the police for raping some teenage girls the year before and said I needed to stay as far away from him as possible no matter what. You'd think that would be where the scary part ended, but no, it gets worse. I'm usually not a cop caller myself since I can hang with an unsavory crowd sometimes, but I went straight home, packed all my things, left to a safe place, and called the police. Here's the worst part. When they finally arrested him, 
they took a look through his phone. I don't know how the hell he managed this, but he had multiple pictures of me on it. Most of them were of me sleeping, or me in the shower or using the bathroom. He had texts to another person about me, and about what they were planning to do with me when he got the opportunity. I no longer talk to Kelly or her parents, and when someone gives me a bad vibe, I instantly get away from them. I'll forever be grateful to Charles as well, because he might have just saved my life by letting me know all that. So I am super creeped out right now. I, 27 and female, was home alone last night, sleeping soundly in my bed in the middle of the night, like would be usual. I was suddenly woken up, though, by the sound of someone seemingly trying to push up on my locked bedroom window. I couldn't see the window from where I was. It was just past my footboard on the other side of the bedroom, and I was laying down. I could recognize that unmistakable sound, though. The window was locked. Someone was jiggling it around, trying to force it open. I know that sound because I've locked myself out on accident plenty of times before and have tried to get in through that very same window. I sat up in alarm, only to get a good look. I saw a dark silhouette of a person looking in through the window. I laid back down for a moment, confused, tired, and groggy. I didn't believe I was actually seeing what I was seeing. When it finally clicked that I was, I shot right back up. Now though, as I looked back to the window, they were gone. I tried my best to get back to sleep, but of course I was too spooked to do so for the rest of the night. In the morning, I thought I might have just dreamed it. I called everyone I knew that it possibly could have been, and nobody knew anything about it. Nobody was at my house, either. Nobody I knew would just try to get into my bedroom window in the middle of the night anyway, especially when I don't think this person even knocked on the front door before trying to jimmy open my window. I went outside to investigate, just to make sure I wasn't being completely crazy. I looked at the window. Lo and behold, handprints of whoever was trying to slide up the glass, all over it. It had rained that night, too, so I could make out their muddy shoe prints going to and from my window, and all throughout my backyard as well. I have no idea who they were or what they wanted, but I'm really glad I remembered to lock my window that night. I'm a 27-year-old female. I graduated from high school about 10 years ago. In my freshman year, I was well-known and had quite a bit of friends. I was very friendly with everyone, and every time I saw someone alone, I would greet them and offer them my friendship as well. Sometime during the year in my math class, though, we had a new guy. We'll call him Jose. Jose had recently moved to the U.S. from Mexico, he hardly knew any English. Me being Hispanic, though, I was able to speak to him in Spanish at least and make him feel somewhat welcomed. Jose had no friends at all and always sat by himself. In that math class, I started helping out Jose quite a lot, actually. He would sit behind me and always play with my hair. Not my actual head, but just touching my hair so I could hardly feel it. I sort of felt like he had developed a crush on me. He was not bad looking either, so I didn't take it as a big deal. For a few months, he just continued to play with my hair like this. It became kind of a norm, actually. He said he really, really loved it. Towards the end of those months, he said he wanted to play a game, and asked me to write the things I loved the most in life. He said he would do the same, and we would both share papers once we were finished. Of course, I wrote down family, God, friends, a whole bunch of other normal things for a teenage girl. When I gave him back the list, he wanted specific names of everyone on it and said he would do the same. I did end up writing the names of my friends and family. One day, we were just hanging out in class when Jose leaned over and whispered to me, Can I show you something? But you can't tell anyone or else you're going to have to pay for it. I was confused. I thought maybe he was going to ask me out or something. Jose suddenly pulled out a Ziploc bag. 
I couldn't really tell what was inside. It looked just like a big tangled mess. It wasn't until he placed it down on the table that I noticed it was a Ziploc bag completely full of my hair. Over full even. Jose pulled up his sleeve and showed me his arm. He had ten healed over knife scars just about that went down the length of his arm. There was a fresh wound as well. He grabbed my hairs from the bag, rubbed it on top of the freshly opened wound from the night before, and said, You're mine now. I know what you love. I know who you love. If you don't do as I say, you'll pay for everything. These are all the scars and the souls that I owe. Anything and everything that happens from now on, think of me. My heart sank. He smirked. I ran out of class crying and ran to the office. Everyone was so confused. I asked to speak with my counselor immediately. I explained what happened and Jose was pulled out of class. He was taken to the principal's office and expelled that very same day. Well, because of that, I now feared for my life. They found all of these notes he was collecting on other people in his backpack. Mine were in there. They had the most. They saw the scars and found my bag of hair. I never heard of Jose again. I've had some pretty fucked up shit happen in my life after that. And every time it did, I always thought of Jose. I haven't talked about this in years. I'm kind of afraid that if I even mention it, he'll hear it and will follow me once more. I got close with God now, closer than ever, and I pray every day that I'll never meet him again. Until this very day, I don't know if Jose was just messing with me or what, but I will tell you that after that encounter, I was no longer the super friendly and open-hearted person I used to be. I grew up in a small town, and when I say small, I mean small, small. As in, we didn't even have a store in that small town. What we did have, though, was a jail. Charleston Correctional, perched right on top of this great big hill. It basically held people who were really low risk. There were still some sketchy people there, though, who had been there for so long they'd earned good behavior treatment. My parents were getting divorced at the time. Both of them were smack dab in the middle of a midlife crisis which left me to care for my three younger sisters all alone pretty much. My best friend lived just up the street from us. Remember, it was a small town, so up the street could still be a good 20 to 30 minute walk. There was a decent snowstorm one night. I got all my siblings tucked in for the evening before I decided to walk up and get my friend. She didn't like walking to my house alone, so I would always walk over and then walk back with her. As I walked to her house, I remember thinking just how quiet and eerie it was that night. When I arrived, her mom started yelling at me. Apparently, I didn't know this, a man had escaped from jail earlier that day. We decided it would be better for all of us to camp out at her house instead of walking back in the dark and snow. We were about to go get my sisters in her parents' car when her brother came crashing through the door in a panic. That guy was out on our street. Granted, he was like a mile and a half away, but I had been walking right towards him and not even known it. We grabbed my sisters and stayed at her house that night, listening to the snowmobiles on the trails out back looking for him. It turned out he had called a cab, murdered the driver with a hammer, ditched the cab in a field by Tate's farm, and eventually gotten caught. That field was only a mile away from my house, we talked about that for a long time afterwards, because none of us had ever worried about having a jail so nearby before that. It's a true story. Happened about 17 years ago in Charleston, Maine, if you want to check. That was the scariest and most unusual thing that ever happened in our small town. <laughs> 